this is Jocko podcast number 149 with Echo Charles and me Jocko Willink good evening Echo good evening all my life I've waited for this now I've joined you and your losses are a strength to me I ache and yet I know that Alec retched with pain on the dust road that went to Corinth. I breathe the dust, and yet I know that Grandpa breathed the gas that made a hero out of Pershing. I flinch when bullets tear the air in angry rents, and yet I know that Father and three farmer boys at Pickett's charge felt a cutting edge that dropped them dead. How can I be bitter? You are my strength, you ghosts. And I have learned those things, those esoteric skills and knowledges that mark me as one of you. That loose-boweled piles of shit too much shit from overeating plopped randomly around the outer dikes of a vill mean trouble catching the aroma seeing the groupings watching flies dance lazily rejoicing in their latest fetid morsel that bends the low grass in a muddy glob like a bomb of cow dung trouble I can tell from the crack of a rifle shot the type of weapon fired, and what direction the bullet is traveling. I can listen to a mortar pop and know its size, how far away it is. I know instinctively when I should prep a tree line with artillery before I move into it. I know which draws and fields should be crossed on line, which should be assaulted, and which are safe to cross in column. I know where to place my men when we stop and form a perimeter. I can shoot a rifle and throw a grenade and direct air and artillery onto any target under any circumstances. I can dress any type of wound. I have dressed all types of wounds, watered protruding intestines with my canteen to keep them from cracking under sunbake, patched sucking chests with plastic, tied off stumps with field expedient tourniquets. I can call in medevac helicopters, talk them, cajole them, dare them into any zone. I do these things, experience these things repeatedly, daily. Their terrors and miseries are so compelling and yet so regular that I have ascended to a high emotion that is nonetheless a crusted numbness. I am an automaton, bent on survival, agent and prisoner of my misery. How terribly exciting. And how, to what purpose will these skills serve me when this madness ends? What lies on the other side of all this? It frightens me. I haven't thought about it. I haven't prepared for it. I am so good, so ready for these things that were my birthright. I do not enjoy them. I know they have warped me, but it will be so hard to deal with a life empty of them. And there are the daily sufferings. You ghosts have known them, but who else? I can sleep in the rain, wrapped inside my poncho, listening to the drops beat on the rubber like small explosions, then feel the water pour into rivulets inside my poncho, soaking me as I lie in the mud. I can live in the dirt. Sit and lie and sleep in the dirt. It is my chair and my bed, my floor and my walls, this clay. And like all of you, I have endured diarrhea as only an animal should endure it, squatting a yard off the trail and relieving myself unceremoniously, naturally, animally. Deprivations of food, 
festering open sores worms heat aching crotch that nags for fulfillment any emptying hole that will relieve it who appreciates my sufferings who do I suffer for and that right there is a excerpt from a book that is called fields of fire and it was written after the Vietnam War by a marine who served there and this book paints a picture of of combat and, and in fact it actually does more than that because a picture you know a picture supposed to paint a thousand words or say a thousand words but pictures don't always properly convey thoughts and emotions you need words to make that happen and and this book really captures all of it horror fear disgust love hate indifference the chaos of combat the sorrow of loss heroism and of course in all that human nature and as I always say about this podcast while yes it is about war and it's about leadership and it's about atrocities and it's about struggle it is most importantly it's about human nature and on top of that the incredible power of the human will and this book fields of fire gives us a very close examination of human nature in all of its glory and of course in all of its horror as well and the book was written by a man by the name of James Webb who was a marine officer in Vietnam recipient of the Navy Cross former secretary of the Navy former senator from the great state of Virginia he's written a bunch of other books ten I believe he's written and produced movies all kinds of stuff on top of that he has five children if I'm correct one of those children Jim also served in the Marine Corps and was actually whose time in Ramadi overlapped with my time in Ramadi where he served as a as a 0311 rifleman as a member of the 16 Marines and also as a radio man in Stapleton so it's awesome to read these books and know their history And it's even more awesome and an absolute honor to have with us here today the author of the book Fields of Fire and also his son. So, sir, thank you for coming. Jim, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I was kind of wondering, because you, you know, James and Jim, and I decided when I was trying to figure out what to call you guys, I, I figured I'd call you Young Jim Jim, and I just keep calling you Sir. <laughs> <laughs> just call me Jim and call him Young Jim. It's easier. So, uh, yeah, I, I can't thank you guys enough for for coming on for coming all the way out here from the East Coast and and to come on this and um, for me to revisit Fields of Fire, which is just a a, a book, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. It's an iconic book about not just the Vietnam War but really about war and and the the wave laid it out and again we'll we'll get into that a little bit but I also wanted to talk to you and and really get some of your backstory as well and your upbringing you know we always try and start with the guests kind of talking about where they came from and what their background was and you have a lot of that actually laid out in your memoir so I was going to ask if it's cool to call this a memoir, but there it says it on the cover, a memoir. (laughs) (laughs) I heard my country calling. And I guess uh, what one little section of this that that stuck out at me, and I think, you know, obviously we'll let you expand on it, but I'm going to the book. So again, this book is called I Heard My Country Calling. And here we go back to the book. When it hurts, just grit your teeth and take it. Don't, ever, don't you ever back down. Never start a fight, but if somebody else does, never run away. If you run from a bully, you will never stop running. But if you fight, he won't risk coming back at you again. Stand up. Fight back. Mark him. Give him something to remember every morning when he looks in the mirror. 
then even if you lose, you win. And by the way, if you ever run from a fight, I will personally beat your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you go on. My father was not exactly a mellow guy. He did not spare the rod, but he taught me early that there is no substitute for moral courage, whatever the cost, and that the ultimate duty of every leader is to take care of the people who rely on him when otherwise they would be forgotten or abandoned. Courage in the face of those above you and loyalty to to those below you were my father's inalterable standards. The only true way to measure the worth of another human being. (laughs) So... There you go. Those are some. Those are some standards your dad laid out for you. He was a tough guy. He was. A, he was a tough guy. Uh, you know, I, listening to you read the um, the excerpt from Fields of Fire, I was just thinking about how long it has been and the journey that I have had since I wrote those words um, in learning. I think we were talking about this last night. Learning how to write by writing this novel. <laughs> writing a novel was an act of will for, for a lot of different reasons. And uh, one of the things when, when I think about growing up in our family uh, was that uh, my dad was a leader. Uh, more than anything, he was a leader. And you know, bit different families have different conversations when, when you're sitting around the dinner table, but his was always. You know, he would talk about different issues, but it, it was always, how do you lead? How do you motivate people? Uh, one of his uh, slogans was, you can make people do something or you can make people want to do something. And so in a nutshell, you know, learning from him, you know, he, he was a career military uh, person. He enlisted in World War II, became a bomber pilot, uh, B-17, B-29s, and was in Berlin Airlift and when I was very young. and. Uh, was transitioning into uh, jets for the Korean War and the uh, air pressure in the cockpit blew out and the jet blew, blew his eardrums out. He got grounded. I'll never forget that day when he came home when he, he couldn't fly anymore. He, we were getting ready for him to walk into the door and my mom says, they took your dad's wings away. Don't ever mention it. And he walked in and he was still wearing his wings. You know, once you qualify, then <laughs> yeah. you don't take off. And so first thing I said to him was, hey, Dad, you, they let you keep your wings. <laughs> he said, go upstairs. <laughs> uh, but then he was a pioneer in the missile program, still didn't have a college degree, put the first atlas in for the Air Force. And one of the, one of the great things to observe as a teenager was when they gave him the command of uh, – an Atlas Thor Scout Junior Missile Squadron. The the success rate on the Atlas at this time out of Vandenberg, we had opened up Vandenberg. It was an 85,000 acre wilderness when I first went out there in, in the eighth grade. But the success rate in that squadron was 11 <laughs> percent, um, and he get, made it 100 percent. 12 out of 12 successful launches. And I'd go with him out to the the pads. To, you know, I went out in 16, 17, and and watch how he dealt with his, his people. You, wait, you just trumped because I always talk about how I bring my. I used to bring my son out to the training grounds and let him shoot machine guns and stuff. But you, your dad brought you out and let you shoot missiles. Let me watch. You just go away. <laughs> you just trumped me as the you dad. Know, <laughs> you know, you could back then. You know, I could go sit a sit in a blockhouse <laughs> like a thousand <laughs> yards away from where one of these atlas was going up. But watching how he treated his people and. On a, you know, he'd been deployed a lot. When he went back uh, into the military, he got rift at the end of World War II because he didn't have a college degree. He, when they brought him back in, they, he was either deployed or uh, stationed at bases that did not have military housing for three and a half years. And we were up in St. Joe, Missouri, where I was born. Uh, my father's family had come in from the Appalachian Mountains uh, and ended up in St. Joe. My mother was from East Arkansas. Uh, very, she had a very tough uh, life, uh, early life. Three of her seven siblings had died of childhood disease, the kinds of things you don't even see anymore. Like her, her uh, sister that was nearest to her died of typhoid fever. When's the last time we've seen an American with typhoid fever? Um, so we were up in St. Joe, Missouri. My mother had four kids by the time she was 24 years old. Um, and my dad was gone and she didn't know hardly anybody in St. Joe, Missouri. We didn't have these family assistance programs like they do now. And it's been one of the great privileges of my life to try to put those into into our military so my grandmother moved in she she uh, was living out in arkansas i mean from arkansas to, to california and uh, came back up and lived with us for several years and 
there was an iron hand in the house. But, you know, my dad would come back. Uh, he'd leave Friday night, get off work at, at one point at Scott Air Force Base, Illinois, drive 380 miles one way every weekend, no interstates, you know, drive all night, Friday night, show up. We never knew what time, Saturday morning, but he'd be in there with, with my mom Saturday morning. Raise hell. Uh, <laughs> Friday afternoon, get in, get in the car and drive back. Uh, but his example taught me more about the axioms of leadership than anything I learned anywhere else. And being able to apply it in the Marine Corps, which you know was one of the great prides of, of my life, uh, was uh, really an extension of uh, what he'd put on the table day in and day out. And, and you know, I, like Jim got to know. Son Jim mm-hmm. got to know, uh, you know, his grandfather, my dad, very well. We spent a lot of time fishing, hunting. We we're an outdoor family, mm-hmm. um, and we've had the same kind of few thousand hours of discussions. I think. I mean, uh, you could, yeah, you so. could very easily say that the passage you read would qualify as the eleventh commandment in our household. Growing up, uh, it was passed down to him, and then passed down <laughs> to me. Very, very, very simply, never walk away from a fight. Um, or never start a fight, but uh, never walk away from one, never quit, and you'll be judged how you treat those around you. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been uh, one of those things I've kept with me my entire life, and it's, I was lucky to have that kind of formative influence at a very young age. And uh, I love the Marine Corps myself, but everything I've learned about leadership is from him and uh, being around his platoon growing up, and it's an absolute blessing. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I know, and and we talked about this a little bit last night because I would have guys that are concerned that hey, I'm not around, and I got you know two kids, and I'm doing another deployment, and and you know I always would tell guys, look, guys have been, I don't know what you call it in, you know, Viking years or whatever, mm-hmm. but it, I don't know if they called it a deployment back then, but mm-hmm. guys have been going on deployment and leaving their families for thousands and thousands of years, mm-hmm. and. And that, to me, is an example. It's it's the you might not be there to directly influence your kid on a day to day basis, but the when when a, a young man looks up or a kid looks up and sees, hey, this is what hard work is. This is what commitment is. This is this is what sacrifice is, and they can emulate that. You don't have to be there every day to instruct them in every single little thing that they do. And I mean, clearly, both of you are examples of that you can turn out just fine even if dad isn't around every night. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was really uh, when I was really young and he was deployed on uh, the Berlin airlift, I, I used to go to uh, bed every night with a picture of him on the runway, on the flight line uh, that Air Force Public Affairs had taken with him and his first sergeant and some visiting general. I still have that picture over my desk today. Uh, but that was, you know, that was, good night, dad. You know, and you look at that, and you you gain an understanding of what it means to serve, and what your, what what your country uh, is all about, and you know, serving your country and those sorts of things. The one thing I would say is, my dad really didn't want me to go in the Marine Corps. <laughs> he, uh, uh, from the job that we uh, were just talking about, you know, when he had the uh, the missile squadron, he had gone to night school for twenty six years. He graduated from college my senior year in high school, and he immediately was deep selected for colonel. Um, and then they sent him to the Pentagon to do legislative affairs, and it was the McNamara era, and he would just he would just go crazy about uh, the whiz kids who were running the Vietnam War, and and we would have these long discussions about you know you're you're just going to be meat, you know you're going to be meat. You know, the, the Marine Corps is a political football. Don't do it. His his line was. Go in the Navy, stay on the ship, eat ice cream. <laughs> and then, you know, when I went in the Marine Corps, it was like, oh, man. And uh, then when my brother went in the Marine Corps, my brother was a Huey pilot in the Marine Corps, it was like, my boys are Marines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, going back to your, your childhood a little bit, you talk about how you moved around a ton. Um, Growing up, I mean, you sound like your dad was a little bit of a habitual house mover. Even when you get somewhere, he would move. You know, you're talking about you, you were in England. You lived in three three different houses, and it seemed like everywhere you you went, you would move around a lot. And one of the things you say about that in the book is, uh, I'm going back to the book here. I not only learned how to read a room, 
but by necessity became an acute observer of subtle body language of each new tribal circle. In each place, I learned valuable distinctions that helped me to develop skills and insights that carried over into leadership challenges during, during my later life. In order to lead people, you must first motivate them. In order to motivate them, you must understand them. In order to understand them, you must be able to grasp not simply their words, but the emotion behind their words. The same words and gestures can have vastly different intentions in Alabama and Southern California and Nebraska and sometimes even within the same town. I learned to be a receiver of information as well as a careful broadcaster. So absolutely, you know. And first of all, with with my dad moving, yeah, we I think the longest we ever lived in a house was like seventeen months while I was growing <laughs> up. You know, it, part of it was the, you know, the Scotch Irish tradition of the uh, the Ulster Scots that settled the Appalachian Mountains and then spread further west. And uh, you know, they 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 like to say, you know, you you haven't you don't stop moving until you've lived in at least two or three houses. There's something over the mountain that you haven't seen yet. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and he we, took uh, that literally. Yeah, we got we got you know the this post World War II military um, was you know it was still sort of sort of reseating itself in terms of of having large standing military and where the missions were going to be with the space program and all this stuff missile program going on. So yeah, we by necessity moved a lot, but then. Yeah, we'd get in a house, Amarillo, Texas. We lived in Amarillo, Texas one year. We lived in three different houses. You know, so, you know I saw one down, the, one down there on Sunset, on Sunset Street. We're going to move in that house. And my brother and I, we lived on the back porch, you know, with the you know, the windows rattling, yeah. uh, you know, et cetera. But, you uh, guys were destined to either become Marines or uh, start a moving company. Yeah, you know, really. <laughs> uh, so then there was an upside, there was a downside of that, and that is, you know, academically, I went to, I think, nine different public schools in five years at one point, with three different schools in eighth grade. No, you know, con- continuum in the academic curriculum. Um, when I started in uh, like the, the eighth grade, it was in uh, Santa Maria, California, when they start, first opened up Bannenberg. Uh, they tested the whole class, and they took four of us, and they put us in a different room. And they said, it was like the beginning of GT, you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you're going you're, you're gonna to be like an experiment. You're going to grow it academically at your own rate. By the time I got to one, two, three, like the fifth school in, in uh, Nebraska, I was on non-college prep, work, release, get this guy out of here. You know, and I, I ended up, you know, like they let us go an hour early and I went to work. You know? But I could always take a standardized test, and that's really how I was able to get into the, the uh, scholarship program that later led me to go to the – to the Naval Academy, but the most important lesson from all of that was I was able to see such a cross-section of America, uh, first in the military, you know, the military was the first institution in the country that was racially integrated, you know, we had a totally different environment than if I had grown up in East Arkansas or somewhere else, but also so many different communities, and you walk in, and you're the new guy, and you read the room, and you figure out where the problem is. But you also, as you know, from from the, from the quote that you read, you learn that a big part of leadership is knowing what motivates people and understanding that different things motivate different people, not only culturally but individually. And so, sort of figuring out uh, what you know what a person is thinking when they are saying certain things to you, what body language means, etc. And you translate that into the the combat environment, particularly in in Vietnam during the Vietnam War when when I was there, and we had an, an incredible cross section, particularly of the the working side of American society. Uh, and and uh, I by that time I'd been a boxer for eight years. I, I'd, I'd been around a, a you know a, a lot of African Americans. My hero when I, when I was in high school was African American, incredible fighter, went to the Olympics in 1964. Um, but the, the uh, Hispanic communities, California, the farming communities, the southern, you know, the southern mentality of which my culture derived. Um, and so when you look at a problem, you look at a potential problem. You know, I got cat ones, I got cat fours in terms of, you know, the, the testing scores of people out there. You learn how to how to listen and then how to make decisions and how to preclude 
a lot of problems that were going on. We had racial problems in the, in the, in the military writ large during that period. We, our society had these problems. I never had a racial problem in, in any unit I commanded. Did you – now, one of the things that while you were jumping from school to school, that was prob- problematic, although you were learning this stuff about – uh, human nature and the way people are you know in one part of the book here you you say from from the time I was 10 my dad had challenged me to read a book a week and if and if that did not remedy my restlessness to try and read two books a week read 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 he urged me and I had including poetry fiction history and anything I get my hands on that was about sports or the military did, you read that much as a young kid constantly and I, that really saved me in terms of the, the you know, the differing standards and uh, whatever in the, in the schools that I was going to. And the other thing that uh, my dad and I would do from the time I was very young was have poetry contests. You know, he was a big, big reader, too. And uh, so, you know, all the way through his, his lifetime, we would do that when, uh, you know, up, up until, you know, very soon before he passed away, we would go every summer. Uh, we'd get the the males in the family of the different generations, get a fishing camp in Minnesota for two weeks and hang out, build a fire, goof around, catch fish, clean fish, talk, talk, talk. And my dad and I would always, we'd do Kipling or we'd do the British and the Irish poets. And, you know, one of us would give a line and another would give another line to see who really remembered, you know. And I always knew when I was like, in high school, when he when he was wanting to go go up to Minnesota, even at that point, because he would go and he'd start talking to my mother. This one is one poem called "Do You Fear the Wind? Do You Fear the Force of the Wind? The Slash of the Rain? Go face it and fight it. Be savage again. I'm going go cold and hungry like a wolf. I'm okay. I think we're going to Minnesota now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and and you also say in a book, um, I knew and as I had always known that I was born to be a soldier. Growing up, you know, we were, uh, and still are, an outdoors family. Hunt, fish, shoot. You know, I taught Jim from the time he was six. Jim started shooting when he was six years old. I got my first rifle when I was eight years old. It was a part of a long-going tradition from the pioneer the pioneer days. You know, here's your, here's your rifle. Uh, I loved being in the outdoors. I, you know, I loved all of the mechanics of that part of the, the world. And of course, um, at that time, post-World War II, you turn on a TV in a weekend and you've got Victory at Sea and uh, you know Air Power and all these shows. And, and uh, um, I loved military history. I watched this stuff and I said, I, I, I'm gonna be a soldier. Uh, and I didn't know at that time, Really, it was a it was a close call in, in high school. Would I go in the army or would I be a marine? I wanted to do that. Um, and when I got to, I didn't know what college was. We, we did, it was not part of our family heritage at that time. You know, directly going to college and figuring out what school you should go to and those sorts of things. So I went. I remember when I was fourteen years old, I went to my dad and I said, "Dad, I want to I, I want to be a soldier." He says, "Go to college." I said, "What are you doing in college?" He says. You're going to be an engineer. I said, what do engineers do? He said, they invent things. I said, I don't want to invent anything. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see stuff. That's right. <laughs> I, want to, I want to go in the woods. I want to, I want to lead people. You know? And uh, so I uh, found out that the, the Navy had this ROT scholarship, this first scholarship, full scholarship program, because I could not have gotten to the Naval Academy out of, out of high school. My, my, my grades weren't that great. You know, I, the other things I had in place, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, the Army did not have an ROTC scholarship at that time. They had a program where after two years you could get a full scholarship, but you only had a partial at the beginning. So I, I uh, applied to the uh, Navy scholarship program. And at that time, uh, you took a standardized test, and anybody who passed a standardized test – got into the interview process and you could go make your case so i went was the school that was heavily military kids in this in the school we had 12 people from our school who passed the test and got into the the uh, interviews our valedictorian our salutatorian all state basketball player all district football player Eesh. and me it's like hey pump your gas <laughs> <laughs> come see me fight <laughs> and uh, i really lucked out because the two interviewers the first one was a, a Mustang commander nice. uh, who had seen me fight. 
and, and just totally by coincidence. His name was Commander Lassiter. He says, you know, where have I seen you before? And I went, uh, it wasn't me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he talked about, what do you want to do? I said, I, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. He says, what are you going to do if you don't get it? I said, I'm going to be here next year. You know, if you, you know, if I don't get it this year, I'll be here next year. Uh, and we, you know, we talked about working through high school because I worked all through high school. Um, and uh, he would come after this. He'd come over. I was packing groceries at the base commissary. He'd come by and, and say hello. And uh, the second interviewer was a Naval Academy graduate who had graduated in the bottom two thirds of his class and from from South Dakota. And he, he, he was saying, we don't. We got enough brains in this world. We need leaders. And he threw examples out, you know, like things you're not supposed to be able to solve. You probably know this from different interviews you went through in, in your time in the Navy. So he goes, we got all this mud in the Mississippi River. What are we going to do about the mud in the Mississippi River? And I said, Commander, I've been thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> I said, look, you know, here, here's what you do. You shut that river down for eight hours a day and you run a big – uh, like a screen through there, like a filter, big filter on on a rotator, uh, and on each end you put uh, like a car wash, you know, with the the sprays. And so you run you run the filters through, and you spray the the mud out, and you put it in a culvert, and you get a truck under there. And I said, Captain, that's topsoil. Send it back up, and you know, sell it back to the farmers. So <laughs> he said, oh, I know, okay. <laughs> and so I got the scholarship, and. Uh, when you when you you mentioned fighting and you mentioned boxing and yeah. uh, you know that you you mentioned it a couple times and well obviously I like fighting and uh, one one of the things I mean I always I, I'm I'm more of a jujitsu player but the things that jujitsu teaches you about life and about everything really and I know a lot of those similar lessons come from boxing you had a nice little uh, nice little thing about boxing in here and I just wanted to throw it out there before we jump too much further because you know boxing stays with you through your through your through your Naval Academy career and whatnot but um, here we go back to the book boxing and the rough hewn world in which the sport resided taught me valuable lessons about human struggle and the thin line between success and failure in the ring you quickly learned that life was not always fair and that it did not always offer you a face-saving timeout when things were going badly. Once the bell rang, you were out there by yourself, exposed for all the world to see until it rang again. No excuses, no sitting out for a couple of plays just because somebody hit you so hard you couldn't see straight and your toes felt numb. When, um, you know, my kids would compete in jujitsu a lot when they were little, and and I would see these kids. I would go to these tournaments, and jujitsu tournaments are very popular, especially out here in California at that time, and they're popular everywhere now. But I would notice that when a kid loses, you know, because my kids played all kinds of sports, whatever, soccer and basketball and this and that. The kid, if the team loses the soccer game, the kids, you know, they walk off the field. When a kid loses a jujitsu match, and this is just not just my kids, but like ninety percent of kids, when they lose that jujitsu match, when they're six years old, when they're seven years old they're gonna start crying and it, you know it made sense to me instantly there's two parts of it that make sense to me number one they're by themselves they're, there's no one to blame it's not anyone else's fault on the team it's just them and number two when you get beat in a com in a combat sport it's there's there's a, a primal thing that you just realize you got beat by another human being in this game and and it's not a game and so it's it's like you said it's like there's no there's no way out of it and for me those lessons that people take away from combat sports are extremely important and it's the things that you just talked about right here they yeah, are absolutely right and on, on a on a number of different levels you know and, and one thing about well first of all one thing about judo and uh, jujitsu is you know when I was a kid I used to read a lot and I read a lot about Asian history and you know you learn the the Japanese philosophy behind it which is to take your opponent's strength and use it against him you know and it was just a kind of a different thing than boxing but I've, I've always thought about that you know and in other areas of, of, of my life I've thought about that and in terms of uh, boxing you know you never know who the judges are uh, you know and one you know you you're, you're you're absolutely right I mean nothing Nothing is worse than losing when it's just you out there. If it when it's a team out there, you know you've got 
you got people you can pat on the back and whatever, but it's just you. Or as uh, one of the great fighters in Omaha when I was fighting used to say, it's just you and the other guy and all that smoke. <laughs> <laughs> but so you you learn to deal with, and you know, when, when I say, you know, may, you may perceive unfairness, you know, you, you say, all right. You know, I think I won that fight, but you can't talk about it for the rest of your life. You just say, "All right, you gotta, you gotta swallow it," and you gotta say, "That was that." Uh, and the other thing is, you have to prepare. You know, when you th- when you say, "I'm gonna," you know, like 15, 16 years, I could, I, I could be fighting in front of three thousand people. You know, Omaha, is, and then I have a lot going on in the winter, and it, you know, it was cold, and they'd come into the Coliseum and watch, watch, and they're good fighters. You know, really, Omaha had Omaha had good fighters back then including a professional uh, uh, stable as well. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna be in front of 3,000 people and I don't wanna look like an ass, you know? And so you put it on yourself. You put preparation on yourself, which actually is uh, a, a great learning tool for being a writer. You know, you, you may think you're working hard or you may think you're just passing the time, but when the book comes out, you're gonna be exposed to all these reviews and that sort of stuff, you know? so. Um, and also, it's kind of interesting because I was just talking to uh, a friend of mine who is in in the government right now, who is a very fine football player, and we were comparing. He was talking about how how hard it was to deal with a certain individual because he'd been a wrestler and he didn't understand how you know you get the team around you to to solve these problems. Well, you know, you learn to to step forward and take responsibility for solutions. You know, if you're in an individual sport, I mean, like, probably more than any other kind of a sport, you know, it's like, all right, this is what I believe and this is what I'm going to fight for. And if we lose, we lose. But mm-hmm. this is what we're going to do. And in my life, combining that with with the Marine Corps, you know, where you are responsible for the lives of, the, of other people and you have to make decisions that affect other people, there couldn't have been better training for any other leadership situation I've been in. When, when uh, going back to where you got selected amongst, to, for, this, for this scholarship program, you, 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 one thing you said is here, nobody's gonna outwork me. Absolutely. <laughs> I remember the day I got that, you know, because I, I, I just said, okay, I'm gonna wrap myself a little tighter here. You know, somebody up there likes me. I, I remember that when I, you know, when the, you got the the letter from the Navy in the mailbox. If it was a thin little letter, <laughs> you know it was a no. You know, and I got the packet. And uh, I remember it was cold. I got that packet, and I went, I did this, you know, <laughs> and I am going to bust my tail, you know. And then it came, all right, back then it was like there were 51 schools that had these programs, and you you listed the top six in order and then yes no yes no will i go to these others and i'm sitting in omaha nebraska freezing <laughs> i'll go anywhere <laughs> and then i put down the six warmest schools i did not know the university of california from the man in the moon but i said university of california sounds warm and i and i put it on the top and i got into university of california i mean they didn't have their nebraska quota that year or something i don't know and uh, had a great time there um and did very well in the military program, and my uh, my Marine Corps, uh, the Marine Corps officer in, in the program said, you, you really should go to the academy, mm. you know, and so did my dad. My dad saw, saw how much fun I was having down there, and he was like, <laughs> we need to lock this boy up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you applied then for the Naval Academy while you're at USC. Yes. And yeah. it, was that, were you surprised to get in there? Well, um, I think first of all, I had I had ranked first in, in the uh, leadership programs at Southern Cal, and I got strong recommendations. Uh, Major Unterkoffler was the the Marine, and uh, and my uh, uh, Lieutenant Colvern was the the Naval instructor, and they both wrote strong letters for me. Um, and I had to get uh, letters of recommendation from high school. And you know, when I was in high school. Um, I did really well in the literature programs, even though I've got put in dummy English my, my, my senior year, you know, and, you know, we were like, what did you do last summer while they were studying the, the great artists? But the woman who was, uh, was my teacher, she saw how much I loved to write and, and read and this sort of thing and say, and uh, so she wrote me a wonderful letter and, and then, uh, you know, I was on the 
presidential appointment side, which was the uh, active duty military. Uh, uh, and I think they took, I can't remember now whether they took 50 or 75, but they took a certain number from the, from the country and, and I got in. So, so I, the, you know, the Naval Academy is a, is a, is a story unto itself. Uh, you have one section, and I, I obviously didn't go to the Naval Academy. Of course, I worked with a ton of people over the years that that did. But I, I thought that this little uh, story, well, I just thought it might capture some stuff about the Naval Academy. And, and I'm going to read this. Going Again, this is still from the book I Heard My Country Calling. <sighs> After dinner, I reported to the room across the hall where the four who had joined evening come around towards its end took turns beating me with a cricket bat. Touch your toes. Aye, aye, sir. I would lean over and touch my toes. They would hit me, swinging the bat as if taking batting practice for a slow pitch softball game. I would then come to attention and resume my brace, which is standing at the position of attention. Beat army, sir. Did that hurt, Webb? No, sir. Touch your toes. Aye, aye, sir. The bat would connect again. Beat army, sir. Did it hurt? No, sir. Okay, touch your toes. Aye, aye, sir. The blow would come. I would straighten up again. Beat army, sir. Did it hurt? No, sir. After they had each hit a couple of slow pitch home runs, it had apparently stopped being fun and their exuberance diminished. One of them finally told me that if I would simply admit that it hurt, they would stop beating me. But for all I knew, even this guarantee could have been double think. If I told them it hurt, would I really be allowed to leave or would it just bring yet another lecture in another round? Or worse yet, did they really want to send me back across the hallway? I had already dealt with Dr. No Pain before dinner. I did not want to survive the cricket bat only to go back to the toothpick, which was another torture they were putting <laughs> me through. The pain actually left my body, or maybe it was merely my brain's reaction, as I would later find out with Marines who were wounded so severely that their nervous systems became overloaded and shut down so that they could not feel any pain. I had, I had detached myself from the moment. It was as, as if I was watching myself from another room. Did it hurt, Webb? No, sir. Just tell us that it hurt, idiot. Did it hurt? I could hear worry in his voice. Somehow, the very abuse that they were now weary of perpetrating had inspired me by refusing to lose i felt that i was somehow winning no sir touch your toes another blow beat army sir behind me i heard them discussing that the bat had split lengthwise on my ass all right get out of here web aye aye sir <laughs> so yeah <laughs> what year was this 1964 yeah Naval Academy was a different place, uh, needless to say, um, than it than it is now. Um, yeah, when Bob Timberg was writing his book Nightingale Song, we discussed that that incident. And one of the comments he made was, um, he, meaning me, uh, was not particularly bitter about it, but he could still give me the individuals' names. <laughs> <laughs> and I still could. I'm not going to. Um, but you know the the Naval Academy at at that time. You know the pendulum swings in terms of indoctrination and the you know, where education fits in and what type of education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that our this class, the class of 1968. Um, the pendulum in terms of plebe indoctrination had swung very far, and it was by company, really. They were like tribal systems were 36 different companies, and some of them were relatively loose, and some of them were really, you know, actually we had uh, two two companies in, in my class that ran out, physically ran out more than half of their plebes. Mm. And these are people who were highly screened. I give some details in the book about the number of class valedictorians, varsity athletes, Eagle Scouts, et cetera, which actually... When people have asked me, you know, what what's the great benefit you got out of going to the Naval Academy? And one thing I said is, well, I knew that I could achieve among these people who had achieved in different ways in, in high school than I had. I, I learned, you know, that I could compete and in, in that, you know, I was on the right track attitudinally and everything. But this class, I think we started with 1350. And um, the first week or two of, of, of plebe year, when some people resigned, they allowed uh, new increments to come in just for a very short period of time. So let's just stick with 1350. I think we graduated 841. Mm -hmm. We had the highest attrition rate of any post-war 
uh, Naval Academy, post World War II Na- Naval Academy class. Uh, and there were some really people who would have been fine officers who were run out for one reason or left. Uh, and that time period, too, um, coincided with the very beginning of the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, a lot of different you know, things that were tearing the country aside. I can remember coming back from boxing practice in the summer of 1964, and we had to know the one of the rates when you went down on the tables was to know the three top news stories of the day. And there on the front page was the Gulf of Tonkin incident in, in the, off of the coast of Hanoi, the picture of the CO, and uh, we were like saying, okay, I think this is, this is really going to happen. And we, the year that I graduated in 1968 was, was the, the worst year for American casualties. Um, and it also was uh, the year where in April Martin Luther King was killed. In, in June, the night before we graduated, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Mm-hmm. It was just, and, and, and to, to back it up, the, the Tet 68 offensive happened before, right before Martin Luther King was killed. So it was just boom, boom, boom the, uh, the last year. And different people reacted in different ways. But I think the majority of the people that I was with there during that period, it, it gave us a real seriousness of purpose. We knew where we were going. It wasn't going to go away, particularly for the Marine Corps. We all knew that we were going. Um, and so um, by the time I, uh, I graduated, there was n- no doubt in my mind where, where I was going to go. It was one of the reasons why on first-class crews, you know, at, at the Naval Academy, you, it used to be after your first year, you cruised with the enlisted folks. You know, we, I lived – with the snipes on a CVS uh, after my first year. That was a great learning experience, too, by the way, to see how hard those guys worked down here. Mm-hmm. They hardly ever saw the light of day. They were a trip, too, <laughs> in, in the living spaces. Um, I remember when they, you know, that we had like six or seven midshipmen in this big uh, living space, and, you know, they're giving us every, the dirtiest job they could give us, uh, you know, get down in the bilges and scrub, whether we've saved this for you, et cetera. And I said, whatever they want me to do, man, I'll do. And uh, so I remember the day they accepted me, we had this first class petty officer who was kind of like the the guy there. And they had one wall locker, it's four by four wall locker where they kept all of their different types of books and <laughs> other supplies. <laughs> and they had a, Okay, Webb, come on over here. And then they gave me the combination to that locker. <laughs> and then they broke out a bottle of booze and they sent a boot up to the to the mess hall and got and, and scored a can of apple juice and came back and we uh, said, "Okay, you know, you're you're all right, Webb, you know." Uh. <laughs> and after my third year cuz I knew I was going to Vietnam, I said, "I'd like like maybe to see the med." So I signed up for a a med cruise. Um, and got on the Saratoga USS Saratoga, and it's like I, as I wrote about in this book, um, we uh, graduated the the morning after the Arab-Israeli War of 1967 began, and so we 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 went to, we flew to Rota, Spain, then out to Suda Bay, Crete, where the Saratoga came in to to pick us up, uh, and they had just met evac the USS Liberty. Uh, the hangar deck was littered with casualties from the USS Liberty, and when we uh, you know, we took the, the small boats out and started bringing our gear in and, and got to, to the hangar deck, and, and there were Marine guards around, and they said, do not talk to any of these people. And, you know, we went up to our, so there were 48 of us that were on the Saratoga. Uh, we went up to our living spaces, and that was an incredible cruise because the Soviet Navy had just broken down into the Med, and we were playing games with them the whole time. Uh, they cross-decked the Liberty casualties into the America, which took them into into Athens. But it was, you know, constant air ops on that carrier while we were there. Incredible learning experience. Yeah, that, that's if you have it seeing air ops on an aircraft carrier the first time that i saw it i was it's 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 insane is what it is it's insane that and that's just normal life on a carrier and you know the difference um uh, in the same thing talking about my dad and the missile squad the difference back then and now was i had a little eight millimeter movie camera 
And, you know, after an uh, evening meal, I could go sit on the flight deck and take pictures of flight ops. You know, now, you know, for, for safety reasons and whatever other reasons, you can't do that. But I've got some great shots of some of the, you know, the RA-5 taking off of those things. And we had spads on there. Uh, <laughs> and that whole cruise, we had a, a, an A-4, they said, with a nuke on it and the front right catapult because of the situation that was going on in the Middle East. So, yeah, man, that's a... Uh, this is a... Uh, I thought pretty pertinent here is you're, you're at the Academy and this is what you're talking about right now But going back to the book as the Vietnam War gathered intensity The leadership of the brigade began posting pictures and biographies of alumni who had been killed or missing in action on a large board in the middle of the rotunda just inside the main entrance to Bancroft Hall the pictures and short Biographies were taken from the lucky bag the class yearbook from the year that each alumnus had graduated The board on which the notices were placed was large perhaps eight feet high and four or five feet wide At its top was a boldly lettered inscription To those who went before of us before us as the class of 1968 neared graduation the to those who went before us board had become two boards and then three a high percentage of the alumni listed were either Marines or naval aviators many of their names and faces were familiar to all of us more than a few included friends and some of these were especially close so that's a that's a reality for everyone there especially because in 1964 that wasn't happening and then you go to 1968 and you're filling up this board. You walk by it every day and look at that, you know, you, you look to see what the new faces are. Um, and the classes of 66 and 67 in the Marine Corps were hit very hard, but that's 68. Uh, yeah, and I think I, I wrote about this, but I think one of the, one of the toughest moments you know, of that period of my life was when I, I was the brigade administrative officer and so, you know, my job, which wasn't much of a job, was to go to the, one of the things was to go to the main office, clear out all the correspondence in there, sort it out, pass it to the rest of the brigade staff, et cetera. And one of them was bringing the casualty reps to uh, the brigade first lieutenant who, who kept the board on. And without even uh, knowing it, while I picked them up, I picked up the casualty uh, report of one of my good friends. Yeah. And um, you you graduate from the academy, and it's time to go to um, time to go to time to go to the basic school and learn. And you know, I've talked about a bit about the basic school. I've had Marines on here that that went through it. Uh, Brian Stan and he gave us pretty good details on the basic school. And but um, obviously at this time for you. You know, I'm, I'm going to, just going to go to the book. For the Marines, combat and overseas deployments were unending. The greatest burden fell on the privates and lance corporals fresh from boot camp who populated the lower ranks of the rifle platoons and the lieutenants just out of the basic school who commanded them. The basic school, which we called TBS, was now starting a new class of 250 lieutenants every three weeks. In pre-Vietnam days, TBS had taken 30 weeks to complete. As Vietnam accelerated, the time a new lieutenant spent at TBS was reduced to 26 weeks and then to 21. But true to the traditions of long-held disciplines of the Corps, this reduction took place not by cutting the quality or the content of the curriculum, but by rather by lengthening the number of hours spent in class and in the field every work week almost every week tbs companies worked late into saturday evening they spent a high percentage of their time in the field and a large percentage of that time was dedicated to night maneuvers and bivouacs our company was given the day off on christmas working late into the evening of december 24th and assembling on the tarmac for a field activity at 06 30 in the morning of december 26th within a month of within a month after finishing tbs the infantry lieutenants among us would be boarding military flights to Travis Air Force Base, California, to report immediately for 13-month tours in Vietnam as individual replacements in infantry battalions that were already engaged in sustained heavy combat. Well, 
Of course, let me, let me say something about, about uh, basic school at that time. Um, that's probably the best school I've ever been to. Uh, they, as, I, as I wrote, the, the course got condensed in its time, but not in the quality of what they were preparing us to do. Uh, on the one hand, the Marine Corps had dropped uh, the 60 millimeter mortar out of its uh, arsenal after the Korean War. They decided that they didn't need it with more artillery, close air, et cetera. They learned early in the Vietnam War that it was a valuable uh, weapon. They put the 60 Mike Mike package back into basic school. So they actually added a, a, t- a tactical package in, into the basic school curriculum. They cut out uh, uh, some of the dress and ceremony stuff. You know, they, they, did, they did take that stuff out. Uh, not, not all of it, but, but some of it. But we worked six days a week. And we worked, yeah, we worked uh, on the 24th and the 26th of December. We worked on the 31st and the 2nd of July, <laughs> I mean, of January. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, I think the intensity actually helped prepare us. Uh, some of the great friends in my life are people that I that I met in basic school. We were constantly together, and by doing this every day, you know, in, intensely every day, uh, you got a better feel for what you actually were going to be required to do. The interesting thing about basic school, one of the reasons I say it was the best school I've ever been to, was um, it was like educational. It was practical, and it was looking toward the future. For instance, any weapon system, we, we learned every weapon in the infantry battalion in basic school. They would teach it to you in class. Then you would walk out, assemble, disassemble, familiarize it, and then you would go shoot it, every single weapon. Um, my uh, first day, my first night as a rifle platoon commander, I took the platoon that I had just picked up into a night move, uh, night ambush and hit a North Vietnamese unit with a 51 cal machine gun, used every supporting arm in the Marine Corps except for close air. Um, a very first patrol. Did all the on calls, et cetera. And, you know, that was basic school. Um, so. Did, did, uh, they, did they go out? How did they run problems with you in the field during the basic school? Would they take you out on patrol? Did they have op four players had, that, uh, would, that would attack you? Planes, um, we ran close air. There weren't any planes attacking yeah. us so in, the same in thing Vietnam. So t- <laughs> oh no, no, no! I, I uh, said, I said, role players. So oh. when you would, when you're doing a patrol in the basic school, oh, I see. How did yeah. you simulate, and how well did they simulate it? Some of it was was uh, walkthrough. You know, you would start with the walkthroughs. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, we had we had really talented. Uh, combat experienced instructors um, and all of our, our platoons broke our company is broken down to five platoons alphabetically you know mm-hmm. you know uh, how that works when you're sort of at the end of the alphabet you know we got the worst gear we got <laughs> <laughs> the last in line for everything and I can remember one night where we were getting dismissed we're in a company formation and uh one of the it was a former enlisted uh, marine in, in our platoon. We were Roberts through Z- Zell something, you know. And he's, he just started yelling, "This fucking zoo!" <laughs> <laughs> and from that point forward, a lot of times when we'd march, we would go zoo, zoo, you know. <laughs> um, but we had, you know, our our uh, staff platoon commander had been seriously wounded as a rifle platoon commander in the Fifth Marines. Um, you know, all of all of our staff platoon commanders had had been uh, in in combat. Uh, there were a lot of talks, you know, those sorts of things. Um, but then on the tactics side, you'd go out, you'd learn it, in, you know, you'd learn it in class. You'd go out and walk through it, and then you'd have aggressors. You know, a lot of these were uh, SDT called SDT aggressors, which were uh, enlisted Marines just back from Vietnam who yep. just loved to mess with the with the, the, the basic school lieutenants. The big problem, and the greatest surprise, I have to say, uh, in, in moving into combat, the big problem was if, if you were, uh, say, for this exercise, if you're the platoon commander on this 
platoon in the attack exercise, you got 49 other lieutenants sitting there saying, no, we're not going to do it that way. No, <laughs> well, you know, look, look, come on, man. No, that's no, which you don't need to be online. We need to be in a wedge, you know, or, you know, you need to whatever, 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 you know. And I'll never forget the feeling of actually commanding a rifle platoon in combat and being on the move. And I just said, hold it up. And everything just stopped. You know, that word just right now. And I got boom. I mean, well, then everybody stopped, you know. And I went, wow, <laughs> this, is, this is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, the, there, were, there were things that could have been taught better. The one thing is that, one of the things that I am very proud of in terms of the way that we did operate in Vietnam, we had, had a lot of leeway to innovate. And it's, that's it's kind of been lost, I think, in the, in the history of it. Um, and there were, I mean, some letters I wrote back to officers that I knew talking about, you don't really, you didn't, you have a patrolling package over here and you got a platoon and the attack package over here. But really what we do all the time is we patrol, then we assemble, then we attack, you know, or, or if we're going to go into a built up area as from the, uh, the, the uh, ec- section you, you read, uh, the excerpt you read from, from Fields of Fire. You know, I know when to go online. I know, I know when to put my troops on. I know where to put my guns. Uh, that didn't come from from basic school. Mm-hmm. The separate the separate entities did. We connected it in the, in in the reality of, of of what we were doing. And I'll tell you, there's a long line. We're getting a little ahead of, of, of things, but there there there's a long line of things that uh, the young leaders in Fifth Marines had done before I got there and. And, and also in what I was able personally to do as a rifle platoon and, and, and particularly as a, as, a, as a company commander. One of the things we saw, and I wrote an article about this concept when I got back from Vietnam, was that the Marine Corps fire team, this is, this is simple and small, but it really is, you know, institutionally uh, important. The Marine Corps fire team is for, for Marines. It was built around the BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle. It had it had it had uh, been put into place in in World War II because at the beginning of World War II the Marine Marines only operated in squads like 11, 11 Marine squads and they found that a squad leader couldn't control nope. directly control eleven people so they went into the triangular concept with the you know the the, the four Marine fire teams uh, but the problem with that was if you took two casualties you don't have a maneuver element. Mm-hmm. And it is built around an, an, an artificial notion because the M16 could be fully automatic. You know, I, I, had, I kept some M14s in, in my platoon as well. Um, so what, I, what the, the young leaders in the, in the 5th Marines just sort of over time just started doing was cannibalizing the 3rd Rifle Squad. Uh, and so in, in our rifle platoon, instead of having three rifle squads and then a, then a gun team attached from this – notional weapons platoon we put uh, the riflemen into two squads uh, and then brought the gun team in as the third squad for the triangular concept uh, and that just kind of happened you know mm-hmm. uh, and no one told us to do it we just said you you know you can't with the casualties casualty flow that we were taking you just couldn't do it uh, any any other way and be effective uh, with uh, fire teams as maneuver elements um, we moved at night constantly fifth marines we moved at night we were known for moving at night we walked when we moved the helicopter assets uh in in vietnam for the marine corps were scarce the the h-46 was was built to standards from uh amphibious carriers amphibious assault ships so they were built to deck space um and you know for amphibious assaults but then when you get in this continuous ground operation, there just weren't enough of them, and they were very vulnerable to ground fire. Uh, so in, in areas where the Army would have been, you know, picking up with a, you know, a, a Huey, you know, getting breakfast and getting on the Hueys, and I'm not running them down. This was a great concept, the air mobile concept. Uh, and, and moving in on, on areas, we walk. <laughs> we, have, we had, for a lar- long time, we had, two H-46s for our uh, entire sector during the day, you know, resupply or medevacs, or whatever. So we did a lot of walking. Uh, it, it, taught, it taught you how to fight at night, but also when something happened, the casualties were high because you're 
you know, asshole to belly button when you're walking along, you know. Um, if you hit a, you know, we, it was not not an uncommon practice. They get a you know, booby trap, an IED go off, and you get an ambush on it at night. You know, your people are packed in, uh, et, et cetera. But, um, and 60 Mike, Mike Mortar, um, I decided, and there were people who taught us this at company tactics in basic school, the 60 millimeter mortar is the company commander's personal weapon. So I decided when I was a company commander, I would get sent, and I liked this, I would get sent, you know, way away at the edge of our battalion's sector, kind of operating independently. But I'd, I'd fire sometimes 600 rounds a day. And I'd, I'd send uh, a, a rifle platoon in to secure an area when we're on the move. You know, paying a combat patrol to get a new spot, send a rifle platoon in, secure the area, take a resupply, have them drop a pallet. I was going to ask you how big in six hundred rounds. <laughs> no, no. See, that's that was the old, that was the, the tradition beforehand. Yeah, you can you can hump maybe forty rounds. You yeah. know, uh, but I'd have them drop a pallet in. I'd have them build two sandbag uh, parapet areas for the sixteen. We kept two. Uh, the TO was three, but we kept two. And I'd use them for prep fires. I'd use them for H and I's. Uh, you know, we and and I, my guys got really really good. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the the mortar teams. I've been out in the field with the uh, w- with uh, the Marine Corps when they you watch those guys set up and fire mortars. You know, just in training, and it's ridiculous how good they are. It's an awesome thing to watch. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Yeah, the reason I, I kind of dug in a little bit about the training because when I came back from my my from my last deployment to Ramadi, I took over the training, and so it was it was all that. That's all all I was trying to do was getting guys ready for what they were about to face, and we had we had this incredible opportunity. You know, we had this. Um, y- you ever heard of Miles Gear? It's yes. Like, yeah. So we had something that wasn't Miles Gear. It was like Miles Gear, but it was infinitely better. It was super high speed, multi million dollar system. Had little speakers on your shoulder, so when you were getting shot at, you'd hear snaps hmm. from these little speakers, or you'd get mortared, and there'd be explosions going off in your ears. It was it was awesome. It was no, awesome. we didn't have any of that. They actually had uh, the very beginning of that concept when we went. L- a live fire early on where they had targets would mm-hmm. pop up and mm-hmm. you'd shoot the target. That was the most sophisticated we get. And what I found with live fire was live fire, because when I came in, it was all, we did everything live fire and that was the big deal. And we still, we never got away from lab, live fire, but we added to it this whole force on force training where you're going against guys with either with lasers or with paintballs. And that was infinitely more realistic because yes. the paper targets never maneuvered on you. And same thing, when you had the, the guys returning from Vietnam who were maneuvering on you and you were at the basic school, I had all my SEALs that had just come back from combat deployments and they were the guys that were going against the platoons that were getting ready to deploy. So it's uh, it was awesome and I would get the feedback I would get was always, hey, it was, it was actually easier in combat, you know, minus the, the, the actual death, but the, the threat of actual death, the maneuvering that would happen, you know, they were used to maneuvering against SEALs who were badass. And now they're maneuvering against someone else that's not quite as, you know, in the game. And also, the enemy doesn't know our tactics as well as we know it. So my guys would know the tactics that this was going to be used against them. So it was uh, it was awesome. But it's it, just when you talk about showing up in Vietnam and and your first patrol, you're going out and you're in that and you handle it, that's, that's a complete testament to the quality of that training because... It's freaking crazy. <laughs> well, you know, I think we were talking about this last night. Attitude development is the key to everything, you know, and getting your mind right as to, in terms of what you're going to do and uh, uh, knowing the assets that are available. And, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, too, you know, uh, in terms of what, what I was going to face. I, I, tell you, I, had, a, I had one really terrific mentor. Um, uh who what when I graduated from the Naval Academy, I, I spent uh, like two months as a drill officer at the at the with the new class coming in before I reported to to basic school, and I was a battalion drill officer. There were six of us. There were six battalions. I I got the Marine battalion officer who had just gotten out of the hospital from having been wounded in, in, in Kantian. It was a company commander, Alpha One One, and. Uh, he was terrific. Bill Stenson was his name. And, uh, you know, he'd been shot. He'd been blown up. And, and he was, like, so easy. 
I mean, no bullshit, mm-hmm. easy, um, and easy as a leader. And so, the other the other five drill officers in my class, they they got their own office, you know, with their battalion officer. And Stenslin goes, "Why do you need an office?" He said, "You you know, so you're a lieutenant now. You get an office. Why do you need an office? Why don't you just sit in my office?" So <laughs> I sat in his, his office, and every day it was like you know talking back and forth you know and i'd go out and i'd do you know let's i go do my four miles and do all my stuff and he'd come back and he'd say what are you doing <laughs> and that's all I'm, I'm 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 getting ready to go to vietnam he says you want to know what it's like in vietnam he said i'm going to take you out tonight and we're going to get really really drunk and i'm going to keep you up all night and then tomorrow you're going to work and that's what it feels like <laughs> and he did uh, you know the next day I was like oh man please don't talk so loud sir and, uh, and then uh before i before i left one of the things i you know i talked to him about before i left for basic school i said Tell me, what did it feel like to get shot at and he goes man you look don't even think about that stuff. I mean, it's just, you know, forget about that stuff. Just do your job, you know. And that was the very first thing I thought about when I took that, that patrol out. I could hear Stenson going, just don't even think about that stuff, you know. So, yeah. I want to take it to the book here for a minute because, uh, well, this is the chapter called Hell in a Very Small Place. And it talks about exactly what you're saying here. So back to the book. From the day of my arrival as platoon commander with Dying Delta, we had been engaged in continuous combat operations. Intensified in recent weeks by a series of unpredictable vicious firefights despite a steady flow of individual replacements The numerical field strength of our rifle company had been reduced by about half over the past three months This was an equal opportunity battlefield We lost Marines through every possibility that infantry combat offered including gunshot wounds from several different caliber weapons and all kinds of shrapnel large caliber rockets rocket propelled grenades RPGs different sorts of hand grenades 61 and 82 millimeter mortar fire recoilless rifles plus landmines of every size from a grenade to large caliber artillery shells the rifle platoons were largely made up of young both officers and enlisted by 1969 the vaunted ranks of the career and staff NCOs who had historically been the backbone of the Marine Corps were showing the the effects of four years of heavy combat in the infantry battalions that impact was both visible and profound within a few days of my within a few days my platoon sergeant the fourth marine to hold this key position in the past three months would leave us a severe case of ringworm covering his torso including his entire crotch area front and back My first platoon sergeant had been hit by a booby trap while maneuvering one segment of our platoon onto a ridgeline during an extensive firefight, suffering suffering shrapnel wounds in his hands and arms and stomach area, blowing off pieces of his fingers and slicing his bladder. The second platoon sergeant had served with us for a couple of weeks and then was sent by the company commander to another unit. The third had picked up his third purple heart after being hit by an RPG and thus had been rotated out of Vietnam. The fifth on his second Vietnam tour became sick of the constant combat and suddenly decided to leave the Marine Corps and our rifle company when his enlistment expired toward the end of this very operation. In practical terms, this turbulence intensified the relationships between the platoon commanders and the squad leaders as daily life and death tactical decisions would need need to be made. In these relationships, I often ended up being the oldest and most wizened voice at the age of 23. I was now on my fourth platoon radio operator, who within weeks would be shot through his elbow, ending his days in the Marine Corps. Two months before, in April, I had lost two radio operators in one day. The first shot through the the hand by by an enemy sniper as he held the receiver of our PRC-25 radio in the middle of a firefight. Luckily for our platoon, if not for him, his hand had partially shielded the radio's handset, which survived the bullet. Otherwise, we would have been isolated, surrounded by hundreds of mobile and highly adept enemy soldiers. On combat patrols that ranged far away from our company headquarters, the tactical radio was our sole means of communicating our position and to call in artillery support and medevacs. This, of course, was why the enemy loved to shoot at it. An hour later, The second radio operator had been blown off his feet. 
hit below the knees in both legs by a booby trap as we assaulted a ridge. Radio operators did not have much luck in my platoon. By the time I left the platoon, I had gone through six. Two of my original three squad leaders had been killed, one by an enemy rocket and the other from a gunshot wound to the chest. The third had been shot through the lung and in the liver during the onset of an enemy ambush. Although grievously wounded, he had survived the firefight and was later medevac to a Navy hospital ship. And so it had been for the officers who had initially staffed our rifle company. The first platoon commander had been killed three weeks before. The second platoon commander had been lightly wounded less than two weeks before and within the next few weeks would suffer a serious gunshot wound in his upper thigh, a bullet narrowly missing it, an artery. I had been lightly wounded and would be seriously wounded a month later. Well, let's set the stage. Um, let's start the final uh, couple of days in, in basic school because one of the most important, uh, what's well, a speech, but one of the most important speeches that I had listened to during my preparation time was given that there was a Marine Lieutenant Colonel uh, who was assigned to the basic school who asked to talk to the infantry lieutenants. We had, I think, somewhere in the 70s of our 243 who finished basic school were assigned to the infantry. <clears throat> and uh, this guy was highly respected. He had been uh, an enlisted Marine, a rifleman on Iwo Jima. He had been a platoon commander in Korea, recipient of the Navy Cross, and had just finished commanding a battalion in Vietnam. And he said, I, I want you to understand something. Vietnam is the hardest war the Marine Corps has ever fought. Not simply because of the casualties, which, by the way, ended up being higher even than World War II, if you combine killed and wounded, more killed in, in World War II, uh, but because of the living conditions that, that these Marines are facing. Um, you, this excerpt you were reading was sort of in the middle of an, of an operation. Uh, in addition to those types of, of uh, experiences, people rarely understand in, in America, the America of then, and particularly the America uh, to, of today, what it was like to be in the Marine infantry in Vietnam, particularly, with all of them, but particularly out in Quang Nam province where, where we fought. Um, the Marines fought in five provinces uh, in, in Vietnam. Um, in Quang Tri, which is where Khe San and uh, up next to the DMZ, uh, to a Tien, which is where Hue was, uh, Quang Nam, uh, west of Da Nang, where, where we fought, uh, in uh, Quang Ngai, uh, when in Quang Tin was also a province then, it's not a province now, but a, a plurality and almost a majority of the Marines killed in Vietnam were killed in Quang Nam province. And I can't give you a really major battle. I mean, there are some uh, operations that, that are notable in sort of Marine Corps lore, but you know, no one in the country would, would even recognize them. These were squad, platoon, company size engagements, um, and the, where the constant, constant combat activity uh, and where the Marines operated were usually outside of anything. We didn't have tents, we didn't have barbed wire, we didn't have cots, we didn't have electricity, didn't have hot food, didn't have clean water. Um, it was an, an extraordinarily rough environment in terms of hygiene, potential disease, and just the wear and tear it put, uh, put on human bodies. So if you put that on top of the combat side and then on, on top of what you had mentioned earlier, which is the constant uh, flow of people through the apparatus that was the combat unit and the political tensions in, in the, the country. You put all that together, you have a very, very tough uh, environment where, where the Marines lived and also where the young leaders operated. Um, so, you know, when I'm taking over a rifle platoon, uh, in in uh, that area called Anwa Basin, um, I'm just off the 
the plane. You know, I've graduated from basic school, a 10 days travel, 10 days proceed, a little bit of leave, get on the plane, um, go through Okinawa for, uh, you know, to, to kind of get your, your uh, time zone straight. And then I didn't even know what regiment or what division I was going to when I hit Vietnam. They, you, we got to, uh, um, actually on, on, on Okinawa, they decided whether, which division you were going to go to. Okay, we're looking at the casualty flow. You guys, you're going to third Mardiv. You guys, you're going to first Mardiv. Uh, and then when you got to Da Nang, headquarters of the 1st Marine Division, they would kind of sort us out to which, which regiment we were going to. We got a regiment, they say, okay, you're going to 1st Battalion. Go to 1st Battalion, they say, Delta, Delta needs a platoon commander. Um, and get on a convoy, take off. The, 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 the company had been through some, you know, some serious combat in the previous days. I think they had had five platoon commanders in the previous five or six months um, so dying delta uh, was the, the where was the nickname yeah <laughs> is that like a derogatory was that just gallows humor we kind of liked it we just got a deadly dying delta you know or dog tired delta whatever but you're constantly on the move um and you know i'm new and they justifiably they're going oh man here we got a new guy here now what um and there's always in the realm of leadership the the relationship that you have to put into place and you don't you know some some people like to say like to say okay when a lieutenant comes in you can be like the observer for a while and go along in a patrol and watch rarely did those people ever fully take over their platoon you're either ready or you're not ready and so i when i, I picked up my platoon um, i got them on a side of a hill and i explained you know did you insert into the field to take them over? Did Pardon you me? did you go right into the field? Oh yeah, they were on the move. They were on the move from uh, Liberty Bridge to Henderson Hill on a company move. The convoy passed by. I jumped off the convoy. I'd I'd talked on the radio to our our, our company commander, you know, before, um, and I didn't even get three days in Anwar. Some you know usually three days in Anwar for familiarization. He said this this guy's class honor man in basic school. Get him out here now, and uh, so I took these guys over. Had him on. A, the side of a hill, and I said, you know, I, this is it, Bob Timberg in his book, The Nightingale Song, called this an audition for a fragging. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, all right, I'm Lieutenant Webb. You call me Lieutenant or you call me Sir. And this is what I expect. And I, I laid it all out, you know, and uh, and one of the things I said, which I think is very important when you're, when you're leading anything, I said, I want you to know something. Anything you tell me, I will believe. Anything. You tell me the sky's brown, I will believe you. And if you lie to me, you're dead meat. And so there was like, what the hell does this guy think he's doing, you know? And then we went out that night, you know, and I sat down, I planned it. We, we, we moved to the new perimeter. I went in, I called my squad leaders Is together. Is that a company size perimeter? Company size perimeter. Um, I got, got my squad leaders in. I said, hey, we got a night act and we're gonna go here in a, I think it was a Fulox. Um, you know, got their input. Listen, 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 you always listen. You know, being a commander doesn't mean you know all the answers. It, it means you know how to make a decision. You know, and and how to how to follow through, um, and uh, so I figured out. I listened to them. I figured out a place where we would go. I uh, had a really terrific squad leader who was actually acting platoon commander that afternoon, um, and set a series of on calls. Did you know thing basic school taught you? Went out that night, walked in. You know, walked into a situation. Used all the, you know, the, the supporting arms. Did our did our thing and. That was put to rest, which was actually a good thing. And then the other thing, which I think is so important, you know, when you say know your people, know, you know, what's leadership? Leadership is knowledge. Know your people, know your job, know their job, and know the next job because you never know when something's going to happen and you're going to have that next job. And it's character. And part of, part of character is consistency and humility before your people, you know, and as you mentioned from what the excerpt about my dad, moral courage. There's different kinds of courage. Moral courage is sometimes you got to take the hits. You got to lay out what you believe is right, and you got to stay with it. Um, and you know, vision. In other words, what even taking over a rifle platoon. You know, I, I, they they knew fairly quickly that I I knew what I was expecting, even though I hadn't done it yet. Uh, but knowledge of people and listening to people i would go in about the, the first you know month or so that i was a platoon commander i would take three hours to set my lines in every night 
sit down in every fighting hole, talk to every one of my Marines, and you find out, as you know, you find out really interesting things about maybe s- simple things like somebody hadn't gotten paid or somebody got married and had a queue allotment, not going to his wife, and nobody's taking care of just simple things, you know. Um, and then, uh, you know, then the bonds move from there. Uh, you, you, just just to reiterate the conditions because I I pulled out this this section in here where you talk about the conditions uh, and just to reiterate what you're talking about going back to the book here in in the rifle companies we spent endless months patrolling ridge lines and villages and mountains far away from tents barbed wire hot food or electricity luxuries were limited to what we could fit inside one's pack which after a few humps usually boiled down to letter writing material towel soap toothbrush poncho liner and a small transistor radio due to casualties and disease during this period in the war relatively few marines would actually survive a full 13 month tour as members of rifle companies in the bush of the basin we moved through the boiling heat carrying 60 pounds of weapons and gear causing a typical marine to drop 20 percent of his body weight while in the bush when we stopped We dug chest deep fighting holes and slit trenches for toilets. We slept on the ground under makeshift poncho hooches and when it rained, we usually took down our hooches because wet ponchos shone under illumination flares making great targets. Sleep itself was fitful, never more than an hour or two at a stretch for months at a time as we mixed daytime patrolling with nighttime ambushes, listening posts, foxhole duty, and radio watches. Ringworm hookworm malaria dysentery were common as was trench foot which in vietnam was called immersion foot when the monsoons came respite for was rotating back to the mud-filled regimental combat base at anhoi for four or five days where rocket and mortar attacks were frequent and our troops manned defensive bunkers at night that was your break time (laughs) (laughs) And why? Uh, yeah, they, they they called it Little Dian Ben Fu. There, you know, because yeah, they had a sign so, that actually yeah, said welcome that. Welcome right? to Little Dian Ben Fu. And you know, to, hey, at to, least they kept their sense of humor. To ver- <laughs> you know, the fir- you know how, you know, people gallows humor is what gets you through <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, and and to sort of set the tone of the uh, uh, on the on the on the tactical side. Um, you need to remember in terms of what was happening to the country at this time. This was uh, a war that had been going on and, and it had its controversies. But hundreds of people were dying every week, still, every week. Um, I, I brought this, and I know we're not on TV, but I, no, I brought this. There's, there's, there's a, can people can watch the video. Uh, you know, you're, you're welcome to keep this and make copies of it if you would send it back to me. But this was the cover of Life magazine, June 27th, ni- June 27th 1969. Uh, average week in this during this period this was the period of hamburger hill etc the uh, uh 242 americans died that week two of, of marines are in in that um yeah. but uh in the uh, post uh post tet 69 period which was april may um we were losing more than 400 americans dead a week uh you know even though the, the war had for the Americans uh, in casualties had peaked uh, in 1968. The the three worst years for combat for the Americans in Vietnam were 67, 68, and 69. They're like the top of the bell curve. Right. Um, we had in, in, in 69, I think we lost twice as many Americans killed as have been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan in the entire war. Uh, and, you know, the American people supported this. And I've always believed in, in what we were attempting to do, however, however screwed up it got. But if you're out here in the, uh, in the Anwa Basin, um, the one thing that a, a good rifle platoon or company commander or battalion commander learned was how to adapt. How to adapt. You couldn't rarely, you could rarely plan uh, operations, um, you know, sort of like what Mike Tyson said about being in a fight, everything's great until the first time you get hit, you know. Uh, on any given patrol uh, uh, or, or day in the Anwa Basin, particularly in Arizona Valley, 
you could hit, you know, some idiot with not idiots, maybe some smart smart individual or small mm-hmm. group of people with a couple of grenades, or you could hit a, a main force Viet Cong unit, which was heavily North Vietnamese, or you could hit a large for large force uh, North Vietnamese. We fought in in May of 1969. We fought with the the 90th Regiment in the Arizona Valley. It went on for like eight days and 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 eight nights. We had a North Vietnamese division in base area 112, right off from where we were. The the mountain started uh, and up into Laos with the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and that sort of thing. Uh, we had uh, a very fine of uh, Viet Cong regiment, which was you know rather rare than an independent mm-hmm. regiment the first vc regiment uh we had the q 83rd main force, force battalion that were operating out of the uh, arizona valley and then you had a lot of cats and dogs and the other thing was this area had basically been written off by by american war planners in terms of the the uh politicization you know they're bringing them into the south vietnamese government at that time they categorized villages intel categorized villages um, a through e uh, in terms of loyalty to the south vietnamese government a was totally loyal e was totally the on the other way and then they had category five which was politically hopeless just forget (laughs) it and uh by 1958 you know the, the the country was divided in 1954 a million people came south including my my wife's entire family not very many went north. Basically, cadre went north, mm-hmm. and they trained. And starting in 1958, uh, they started moving back into central Vietnam. The uh, Ho Chi Minh's idea was to, or whoever was doing his planning, was, was to cut off central Vietnam first, Annam. Uh, and so you had these assassination squads move into, into this area, uh, and by 1961, they were killing 11 government officials a day. Uh, and that was by John Kennedy's uh, uh, account when he decided to start increasing our, our uh, troops there. So the villages had had their fights uh, beginning 58, heavily 58 to 62 that time period. And uh, those who were staying with, with the uh, communists basically had kicked out the people who weren't. A lot of them moved to Da Nang and some of them later to Saigon. So out where we were, you, I, I say this because operationally, the populated villages that we, uh, that we operated in, you know, they had big family bunkers. They were very, uh, you know, they were stoic when we went through. Their people were up in the mountains. Uh, we had, we had uh, no illusions that they were going to be uh, moving to our our side, at least during the, you know, I, I never thought the war was going to end the way that it did, but at least during the period that we were there. I, we, we were chatting about this a little bit before, but I, I wanted to call out this one point from the book. Um, almost every Marine who has ever fought in close combat can relay us stories of short rounds, stray rounds, misdirected shots, accidental discharges, and other chaos resulting from friendly fire. Mortars, artillery, and airstrikes can easily wander from their intended targets, sometimes due to map error and other at at other times because of human error. Historically, friendly fire incidents during mobile close combat operations make up about 10% of casualties. Intramural firefights can break out among friendly units that misidentify their fellow infantrymen, particularly while moving through enemy terrain at night. And you got one incident that you call out the CH-46 helicopter approached the perimeter ready to drop our day's load two Huey gunships circle overhead flying for cover the highly vulnerable resupply helicopter which would soon be hovering above the battlefield and slowly descending into the small dirt clearing we had scraped out to make a landing zone at the center of our perimeter the strobe light flashed showing the pilot where to land but circling in the weed beds One of the gunships mistook the strobe light for the tracer bullets of an enemy machine gun. The Huey immediately powered toward us in a low attack line that came in just above our heads, strafing our weary, beleaguered perimeter, perimeter, its machine gun spitting out hundreds of 7.62 millimeter bullets. I had just climbed a small sand dune to urinate at an empty spot away from the perimeter poncho hooches and radios of my platoon command post. 
The Huey's machine guns sprayed back and forth inside our lines, kicking up a trail of dust spots just below my feet as I stood in the open. After one pass, the Huey was finally waved away, back into its circling defensive laps around our perimeter. Exposed as we were, it seemed a miracle that only one Marine, a radio operator, near the strobe light in our com- company command post was hit, taking a bullet in the stomach. Well, I, I, that's one uh, among, among many when you're, when you're fighting so, <coughs> so close. Uh, and, you know, and actually, that, that incident uh, occurred not too long after an arc light strike. We were doing the BDA on an arc light. Um, it's one of the great ironies, if I might, may digress just a little bit, because I think it's important to, to point out um, that in, in our uh, operational concepts, we never used uh, B-52s north of Vin. We never, un- until 1972, the Christmas bombing uh, of, of Hanoi. Um, and when I go back, I've been back to Vietnam 28 out of the last 29 years. I speak Vietnamese. I, you know, I... Uh, we, we still have our disagreements, but, uh, you know, I, I go back there. And when I first started going back to, to Vietnam uh, in the early 90s, everybody wanted to talk about that eight days. Everybody. You know, when they did this. And they, they were living under the illusion that they were withstanding American air power when we had these light aircraft like John McCain's aircraft coming in and, you know, making the runs. When if somebody had made a different decision, I mean, a war is a war. If somebody made a different decision, things might have might have happened differently. But... We did use arc lights mm-hmm. on the area that we supposedly were were trying to salvage, you know, Gonoi Island. Um, you know, we lit that place up. We were uh, our uh, our company was I think three clicks away when when that when that arc light landed, and I was holding on to the ground, moving to the right and to the left. You know, um, how many how many pounds of bombs would get dropped during one of those? Oh, I got, there's, I've got some statistics in there, but. Just, Thousands and thousands of, of pounds of of uh, you know three three B fifty twos would yeah. go over and actually I think in there I, I put the the number I uh, but um, you know so but to to the uh, the the friendly fire incidents and how close it was um, you know we the way that we would mark um, our areas when we're when you're on close air in that environment. Uh, you you know and, and this isn't about the helicopter hitting our, our guy that was uh, you know mistaking the strobe for a, a machine gun round but in general you always run your airstrikes parallel to your lines because mm-hmm. you don't want them to drop short mm-hmm. you know and drop on you so they have to make a run you know they, they, you know, we put air panels out usually sometimes we pop a smoke but it's better with air air panels uh, during the day um, and uh, so they they'd make a run before they drop and uh, so they you know they say okay. You know, no, you're too close. No, you're not, or whatever. And uh, we had one <laughs> in uh, d- during this period where uh, we were fighting the 90th Regiment out there in the Arizona Valley in May. We were running an airstrike uh, against an NVA unit in a tree line about 400 meters away, and we had F force coming in. You know, an F force a fighter. Mm-hmm. It's not a bomber. <laughs> I mean, we use them for bombers, but. Uh, so the F-4 pilots, they're coming in at, I don't know, 450 knots, whatever it is, and they're, they're looking out the side of their window to see, to see what's on the ground. So we were running the, uh, the F-4s. I had, my platoon actually was, uh, we had a rear security in the perimeter while they were doing this. And uh, they made their run, and then they came on the second run, and the, the F-4 dropped on us. And uh, it actually, it bounced right outside our perimeter, and then you know I mean, what the hell I hear I hear it going right over the top of us, so I turn around I start you know I want to go into the company CP and ask them what the hell is going on. So I'm walking through this scraggle of bushes and I got all these Marines running running the other way and this thing had bounced and we call this snake and nape. You know the the snake was the the way uh, uh, a like a kind of a propeller would break out of the, the tail to arm it okay. when you when you drop it, and luckily the the tail had broken off of this bomb when it hit and uh so but you know i turned around and these guys are you know i i see this thing flying through there i thought it was a body 
you know, it's this green thing flying through the air and going down toward the toward the CP, and I'm going in, and all these guys are running the other way, and and that that bomb had had landed on the pack of our 81's FO artillery radio operator. I mean, pack it was pack board, you know, uh, dead center. If that thing had gone off, mm. curtains, you know, uh, and the other thing is night moves, you know, where one of the things you learn. Is in 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 uh, when you when you operate like the Fifth Marines did is always be responsible for the person behind you, not the person in front of you. Uh, if you lose the person in front of you, stop. Don't try to catch up with them because there there were a number of friendly fire incidents where someone would get get lost, uh, try to catch up, end up to the on the flank of, of the the main unit and you'd have an intramural firefight luckily we, we didn't have that happen in my company but it happened uh, uh, in the in the fifth marines so you stop if you can't find the see the guy in front of you stop and then if then if you can't see the person behind you then you retrace the exact uh route that you've been on to go pick them up hmm. um so you know there were lessons that were learned and put into place yeah we we, we always talk about the fact that and, and Leif was my, my buddy's platoon commander uh, with me. He and, and wrote books with me. But um, he was saying, you know, if you would have asked him before we went to Ramadi if we would have blue on blue, you know, fratricide situations, he'd have been like, oh, there's no possible way. And and me, same thing. You know, like it seemed like, especially in the SEAL teams, it was like, oh, that's never that will that will never happen. It'll never happen. And sure enough, I mean, there in that book in our in our first book. We happen to write about three different. I mean, there's 12 chapters, and three of them concern friendly fire because you had to be more concerned about. Well, not more concerned about. You had to be at least as concerned about deconfliction. And you know, we would hang, we would hang, you know, giant aircraft panels. Once, once my guys would take a building for a sniper Overwatch position, oftentimes, if there was any question about where they were, they'd hang giant air panels right out the way. Like as soon as they started shooting and the enemy knew where we were, we wanted to make sure that the friendlies knew where we were just as bad. So yeah, the 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 um, the friendly fire problems that happened, but when I came back and I started running training, I would induce those. And and, and they happened to 100% of the platoons that I put through training, 100% of them had, had blue on blues, you know, with paintball or with uh, the laser tag system that we used, because it's, it's one of those things no one thinks it can happen to them you know the other the other part of that to be really frank here um, in uh, the the areas where we were operating um, you know you you don't uh, we'd send night acts out every night you know you you we could move we moved every three four days new perimeter um, you'd send out listing posts and listing posts and ambushes um, after dark and you know you got Marines out there they don't really know where they are you know I mean they, they don't have a map you know you mm-hmm. two or three people in platoon have a map um, and sometimes they aren't out where they're supposed to be or they or where they think they are uh, and sometimes you know if you get somebody who's getting a little flaky you know he'll say well we don't have to go out there well let's, let's just go sit in this bomb crater here and they had an incident before i got to the company uh where uh, there was a, a fire team that was sitting in a bomb crater about 50 meters out, outside the lines and uh, a guy stood up at like two in the morning to take a leak and the marine on, on the line shot him and uh you know the guy who shot him ended up being a chaplain's assistant i mean you <sighs> live with that the rest of your life uh and by the time i got to be a company commander i i Put something into place which was very effective and that is the first thing I would do is I would send out my night axe when it was still light and I would send them what I called a day pause uh, the listening post out to an outpost further away uh, the ambush to a site I would have them walk by the site where they you know quietly check it out and then go to a to a pause like 100 meters away or whatever so and then when it got dark they both were moving into known terrain mm-hmm. um, you know the, the LP coming back toward the perimeter so they had a sense of security there the ambush having researched the you know the ambush and moving back into it and then I would mortar their day pause <laughs> 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 and the first time I did that, I had an ambush out about a click and a half away. 
And they call me and they go, be advised, you're dropping mortars on us. I say, you are not where you're supposed to be, dude. What, what are you going to do if you, if you hit something? You know, what are, you know where are we going to drop? We're going to really drop rounds on you, you know. So, <laughs> so it got everything real straight. When in doubt, drop mortars on your people. So get your, make sure, well, if, you're, if, if I'm hitting you with a mortar, you're not where you're supposed to be. And it's going to get a lot worse if you get hit out there. So. Oh, man. That's, that, that'll solve that problem. Uh, you, you talk about. You know, I walked. This is back to the book. I walked every square kilometer of those ridges and rice fields. I fought many of those villages. I was wounded there. And here is where I and my fellow combat veterans stand on one side of a great impassable divide, with the rest of the world on the other. Yeah, because every one of us knows that if our luck had run out, or if someone among us had made one inadvertent mistake. We could have died there. No question. You can be, that's one thing about, you know, I've heard you talk about IEDs before, you know. I would say 25 to 30% of our casualties were IEDs. Most of them were gunshot, a lot of shrapnel wounds. Uh, but with an IED, there's nothing more demoralizing or booby trap, as we call it them. Uh, and the, particularly if you're moving at night, the casualties are large. Uh, and uh, there's nowhere to put your anger, you know. You can, and and if you're on the on the outside of that, you go whoa, you know. That easily could have been me. You can be a hundred percent right and still be dead. We had one device on a night move. Every member of my platoon stepped over it on a on a narrow trail. I was walking fourth fourth marine fourth marine in the in the column. And the last, I t- we had a brand new guy. I, I put him on tail in Charlie. It was a company move. We were actually leading a battalion then, but it was a company move. And it was uh, some branch on the trail or something, and kaboom. And, uh, you know, there were 19 casualties uh, and an ambush after that. So, Yeah, for those of you that aren't in the military when you're moving at night, especially pre-night vision, then the only way you can do it is you have to be closer to the person in front of you because you got to be able to see them. And so what that does, and, and you'll be within within being able, and sometimes when it's really dark, you'll be able to touch the person in front of you. So therefore, if someone hits a booby trap or an IED or you get ambushed, the casualties are, are increased dramatically because you're just all together. And uh, to add one thing about Ramadi on yeah. that is, uh, I think when we got there, they had 140 known IEDs on the board at any given time. And uh, there were a couple different incidents. Um, one one in particular that sticks in my mind was when we were putting in uh, the 17th Street Security Station. Uh, a friend of mine's platoon was out uh, providing external security with gun trucks. And I guess he's, his truck sat on an IED all night. And then right when they were about to move, it went off and mm-hmm. took the front of the truck with it. Luckily, nobody was killed. But it's... Uh, nothing you can shoot back at you can't really prepare for it yeah um, um sometimes you got to get lucky we, we had the similar thing where we we were going to a combat outpost in a convoy of just you know our seals heading to a convoy or heading mm-hmm. to a combat outpost and my point man or lead driver or someone said hey i think there's something ahead of us in the road stops the vehicle mm-hmm. i'm actually watching him he gets out looking underneath the vehicle with a flashlight to look and see <laughs> i'm thinking to myself hmm this doesn't seem good could, didn't identify anything mm-hmm. we roll through we get to the combat outpost and then a, a couple hours later uh, the dagger clearance team came mm-hmm. through and found a triple stack you know 120 millimeter mortars that would have killed everyone in that vehicle for sure and if Absolutely. not a few others so uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good and for those of you out there, if you think you're on an IED, maybe not the flashlight approach. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Quietly walk away. Yeah, I've, I had, I, I did that. It was a, my, my first deployment to Iraq. I'm, I'm standing there and my EOD guys, we're doing a target hit and I, my EOD guys find a, a, a booby trap and it was in a planter box outside, perfect spot where, a, where an assault team would stack up. And there was a little plant and it was filled with uh, two or three 60 millimeter mortars that were rigged from the house. Mm-hmm. And so my EOD guy found it was just you plug it into the wall and it goes off. So there was and there was actually a little a little hole cut in the curtain so the guy could actually sit there and watch and mm-hmm. when we rolled up, boom. And so he found the wire, he saw it went out the window, followed it out there, finds the booby trap. And I'm standing there watching him uh, you know, disarm this booby trap. 
And he looks over his shoulder and he says, you m- might not want to stand here. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> that's a good point. I'll be uh, somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, they, uh, in, in this area, uh, in this area of, of Vietnam, um, they could become accustomed to a lot of our operational uh, decisions. You know, we like the high ground. We like to get a spot where you can see some of these rice paddies were like a mile wide, you know, and if you, you want a place where you can have visuals and also provide, you know, potential su- supporting weaponry for people crossing the paddy, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, they, they picked these out, you know, and uh, um, we had one hill, Hill 11 in the Arizona Valley where, uh, uh, you, you know, we'd send – when, when we'd be getting these terrain features, the thing you do is you'd send a platoon to sweep it. You know, when you first get up, sweep it, secure it, not just for, for buoy traps, but, you know, for putting your your, uh, your other uh, units in. The platoon swept it with second platoon. They found a mine, uh, blew the mine. Uh, I left – I was going to – put my lines in and I would I uh, didn't want to bring my platoon up on that hill with with the uh, having found the mine so I uh, uh, left the rest of my platoon on the bottom hill put an air panel on McGarvey's head uh, <laughs> the, uh, my radio operator said do not move I want to see where you are I brought my squad leaders we were clearing lanes down into where we were going to put uh, our Marines and I heard this kaboom and I look up behind me and someone had moved these people up to the top of the hill. I turn around to see a guy flying through the air with a big artillery round. Um, and I saw McGarvey come running with his arm hanging by by a shred. He was standing behind him, so we, we had casualties on top of that hill. Pretty pretty messy after a lot of other things we'd been through. Um, and um, then the next morning, our uh, 81's FO, you know, we, we set up our perimeter, got mortared that afternoon, uh, and uh, he he rolled over <laughs> the next morning and his elbow went down. And he reached up and it was like a piece of, little piece of C-ration cardboard. Uh, he peeled it, covered with mud, like, you know, like plastic surgery, mm-hmm. so nothing, lifted it up. And there was a 175 artillery round with a pressure release detonator mm. on it that he had slept on all night. Uh, if he had just rolled over, it would have been. I think they found 15 booby traps on that on that one hill eventually. Um, so, what a nightmare! Um, and I guess what a what a good job on him on on getting a sound night's sleep and not rolling over. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he's probably. Woke up in the middle of night on that oh, one a few man. times, thinking uh, about how lucky, how lucky. Easily. How lucky you. Um, here, here's you talk. You talk a little bit about the overall, kind of the overall. I guess the overall occurrences that were going on were beyond what's just sitting right in front of you. So here we go. But something else was going on. It stemmed from the reality that on a, any given day, three different wars were being fought in the basin. The first war involved conventional combat against North Vietnamese Army regulars and main force Viet Cong soldiers. The second war was the daily challenge of an insurgency dominated by a long-term war of attrition aimed at driving American public opinion and troop morale against our own involvement in Vietnam. At the beginning of what became known as the American War, Communist leader Ho Chi Minh famously predicted for every one of you we kill, you will kill 10 of us but in the end, it is you will, who will grow tired. The third war focused was a focused and precise form of domestic terrorism. At this point in our history, America's top leadership had yet to fully grasp the power and impact of a type of terrorism that went well beyond the traditional notions of military insurgency. Nor did the South Vietnamese government ever find a way to completely counter it. It was, uh, sorry, a largely invisible war of terror and seduction was taking place daily among the rural populace designed to discredit the South Vietnamese government and to drive a murderous wedge between the people and the government and you go on to talk about uh, Bernard Fall and his book you know he's a French author who wrote a bunch of books uh, spent time there wrote a book called hell in a very small place and he warned the dick van am I saying that right dick Dick Vaughn Dick Vaughn 
um, or moral intervention cadres the, these were groups and what they were doing was the violent act for psychological rather than military reasons which is the source of the success of the Viet Minh and the Dick Von will simply go on murdering village chiefs youth leaders teachers and anti-malarial teams thus isolating the Saigon government from the countryside and you describe one of these situations there was no warning from around that unseen bend the air suddenly belched and erupted quick explosions piercing our ears and reverberating like an unseen blast of wind my adrenaline surged I counted three quick bursts of rifle fire and then a whoomp of three grenades the entire platoon became animated tense picking up the pace to a jog as we strode toward the noise within a few heartbeats a young Vietnamese wild-eyed and gasping for breath collided on the trail with the point man of the platoon Instinctively, the Marine tackled the young man and held him on the ground. We did not know it yet, but there had been two others. After its attack, the the assassination squad had split apart. We would not capture the other two. More regrettably, we would not be able to kill them. The district chief's meeting had not lasted very long. We were the first Marines to reach the hooch. I quickly deployed my platoon in defensive positions around it in case there was a second attack. Then I stepped inside the shadowed, blood-soaked room. My platoon corpsman and my radio operator came with me. Within minutes, our company's chief corpsman stepped inside, having jogged down from the command post on Henderson Hill. Their Unit 1 medical bags would soon be empty of battle dressing and tourniquets. Together, we began the ugly business of triage, separating the dead from the near dead and the near dead from those who might be medically saved. Inside the hooch, my hands, armed, arms, trousers, and boots had quickly become covered with blood. We pulled the dead outside, lining them up in the field as if they were already under markers in a cemetery, then covered them up so that the feasting flies might find some other place to linger. We had a problem with flies on the battlefield. They buzzed everywhere, into our food and onto our open sores. On an earlier morning, I had counted more than a dozen floating inside my canteen cup as I heated a mix of water and sea ration hot chocolate. Foolishly, I had bitten into them, thinking they were chunks of chocolate. We carried out the wounded. On the dirt floor of the hooch, we had found them wriggling and turning like worms among each other as they had sought to escape the ankle-deep syrup of blood and innards. I noticed the district chief's young deputy deputy who stood out from the others due to his fancy clothes. Blown backward into a family altar by the blast, he was frozen in death with one arm raised in the air as if he were trying to catch the grenade that had killed him. That hand was gone. Nothing but the top of a forearm remained, its white tendons sticking out randomly like unspliced electrical wires. I had approached an old woman who was leaning back against a mud wall with a stunned look on her face. Her jaw had dropped and her eyes stared unbelievably at nothing. I had thought she was merely in shock. I pulled her arm and immediately recognized the lack of muscular response of the dead. I took a closer look and saw that she had taken a square, nickel-sized piece of shrapnel in the middle of her forehead just above her eyes. And so on. As I waited in the muck, it did not get any better. This was the war we were losing, perfectly summarizing Bernard Fall's observation. On this morning, the Viet Cong were not asking for anyone's support. They were asserting their control. For all of the bombs we dropped, many of them so randomly that they killed people, that they killed the very people we were trying to help, and for all the for all of us enemy soldiers we killed, our leaders did not understand the cold, focused violence perpetrated by the other side. They had deliberately r- killed a room full of their own people, a violent act for psychological rather than military reasons as a warning to everyone in the basin that it was a crime punishable by death to even attend a political meeting hosted by the other side. True. Let me let me uh, see if I can I can go back to the three points that that you read about and um, just elaborate a little bit. There were three wars in any given day. I uh, talked a little bit about it earlier. On the straight 
a conventional side, unit against unit, there's there's no question we we defeated those forces. Um, finally, and you know, people during the war were talking about the body count, the body count, the inflated body count, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in 1995, Hanoi admitted they lost 1.4 million soldiers dead. 1.4 million soldiers dead. Uh, we lost 58,000. The South Vietnamese, who I, I, I really want to say something about because I, I think they are, have been disrespected by history, they lost about 250,000 dead. Um, and so we did our job. That was our main job. The second war you're talking about, the guerrilla war, I think we did well. But – we could have done better. One of the things that Bernard Fall uh, talked about was how our, uh, you know, our supporting arms. Our, we used, we used, um, we heavily used artillery, mortars, and these sort of things. And in the villages, it seemed kind of random. Uh, and the communists were very focused, you know, not not on the battlefield, but how they used stuff outside the battlefield. They were very focused on who they were, who they were after. Uh, in addition to like showing that they could they could meet up with us, but even on even on that war, I mean, we adapted, and I, I, in that area that I operated in, um, you know, I, by the time I had been there four or five months, I understood the tempo of that place. I understood where they where they were, where they had been. I could anticipate them, uh, and we did some I think some really great things. By the time I got to be a company commander out there, in terms of knocking knocking them off balance keeping the morale of our troops up you know showing them that we we really we could go where they were and we could figure out what they were going to do um, the third was the key and I will say I want to say a couple things about that first you know the, the the South Vietnamese the motivation of the South Vietnamese I think has been misunderstood uh, and I didn't understand this when I was in Vietnam. I understood this a lot better when I got back from Vietnam. I started working with the Vietnamese community here after 1975, helping them understand the political system that they were moving into. You know, they came they came here. They were very they were organized into community groups. They they knew that you know they um, were going to put the future into their kids. You know, from day one, it was like you get a job. You know, uh, but meeting with them, get a job, get your kids in school, the next generation is going to succeed. Um, but also, they were able to explain in a way that I never got out there where I was about what it was they were trying to do and how, you know, if you could, the, the communist uh, approach to this was very Stalinist. Ho Chi Minh was, he may, he may have been a nationalist, but he studied the common turd in, in Moscow for like seven years. Uh, he knew the tactics that were going to be used to eliminate the opposition, the Vietnamese opposition, and to also put the markers down. Um, the, the South Vietnamese uh, never found a way to totally respond to this, and they were constantly getting their leaders. They had a lot of corruption. The culture is a Mandarin culture. There's a lot of corruption in the, in, in the cult, culture at large when you get – uh, you know, people in positions of power. It's a very big, big temptation in the Mandarin system. Um, but they were saying, um, despite what I mentioned earlier about the assassination programs that were not fully understood in, in our country, they were saying, the people who were opposed to the war were saying, the South Vietnamese are so corrupt, they won't go out there. You know, we have a district chief in Da Nang. He lives in his villa. He has a great life. He won't go out to the Anwa Basin. Um, and so our company commander, who part of his first tour he had done as a you know pacification officer working with them, said, we're going to get him out here. We're going to get him out here. We're going to protect him. Uh, and they found out about that. And as, as I wrote in the book, I mean, they, they killed – 17 of their own people in one little room and the the district chief and his aide you know just to send the signal um, that signal was well understood you know by the, the, the people in in these areas and what we were doing was not as well understood even by ourselves one of the you know the most interesting moments for me was when I had a uh, I was toward the end of my tour. I had a Marine who was getting court-martialed in Da Nang for hitting an NCO. Uh, he was not in my company, 
anymore. Uh, but he said, I'm getting court martial. Like, you know, he called on his landline on a regimental three shop, you know. He said, I'm getting court martial and I don't, uh, you know, I don't have a lawyer I can talk to. Can you come in and help me? I said, all right, I got permission to go into Da Nang. So I went to the three math headquarters. They had this great dining hall, you know, that you had to try to get to. So I went over to the three math and had dinner and I went to a bar and this this woman, this Vietnamese woman, was working behind the bar, and she had a black diamond sewn into her owl's eye. Um, and uh, so she was, you know, she saw me, you know, all droopy, you know, mustache, my boots are blonde, I, I definitely, my hair's a little long, I definitely don't belong in three math headquarters. She said, "You're a, you're from out there." You know? <laughs> I said, yeah. She said, where are you? And I said, I'm uh, in Anwa. And she says, oh, I'm from Dialog, which is the, was the major town at the corner, eastern corner of the Arizona Valley. And uh, she said, you're doing so much good. And I went, oh, really? And she said, she said, you know why I wear this? She said, they killed my entire family. She said, in Dialog, her, her father was a police officer. They came in at night. They killed everybody. She was shot. Uh, you know, everybody but her was killed. Her husband was an Arvin. He was just had just been killed. And she said, "You know, you we, you know, we can go places now we couldn't go three years ago. You know, you are you are winning, and you know it's the first time anybody had ever ever said that to me. You know, and another comment needs to be made, and that is that the South Vietnamese leadership, uh, the military leadership, my age." There were a lot of really fine leaders in there, and even even David Hackworth, you know, who said, uh, you know, this North Vietnamese flag is going to be flying over Saigon by 1975, also said emphatically to me when I was interviewing him, if you'd gotten these people into position, they would have, they would have. I'm not going to say they would have won, but they would have survived. South Vietnam mm -hmm. would have survived, like South Korea, survived. West mm -hmm. Germany survived for an eventual better solution. So they they have been, I think. Uh, you know, libeled in in history in terms of the competence of of a lot of their their really good leaders and people and mo soldiers and and marines and that that's and that's from your perspective. Of the, were you doing joint patrols with them? Well, here's the interesting thing. Um, one of the reasons that uh, the uh, the combat tempo went up in early '69. Uh, was that Nixon had been elected president. The, 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 the communists were very smart at keying in their military operations to our politics. 64, Gulf of Tonkin. 68, knock the president out at 68. 72, the Easter Offensive, which uh, Colonel Reeder, was that his name, was, was talking about so eloquently in one of your shows. And they wanted Nixon. Nixon was going to meet President Thieu on in Guam in June of, of uh, 1969, and they wanted the Americans to say they're getting out of there. I don't know, so I, can't, I couldn't sit uh -huh. there when I was over there going, yeah, this is what's happening. But so, late April, all of May, Hamburger Hill, 90th Regiment, every, you know, the place lit up, 450 people dying. Um, but Nixon announced Vietnamization. It's been mocked. It should not have been mocked. Um, in the Arizona Valley, we, we hadn't seen South Vietnamese out in the Arizona Valley. And then I was out there as a company commander, they brought a ranger unit out, and it kind of got waxed. And, and we actually moved in uh, to, their, you know, to their, their perimeter, and they were jumping on the helicopters to, to get out. Um, and then they sent a unit, um, well, the 51st Arvin Regiment out there, and these guys were good. I mean, I would have I operated with them any day. Um, and I've got you know, many, many friends uh, who were Arvin in Vietnam who will talk to you about what happened when the Watergate Congress took over, you know, when the Nixon resigned mm -hmm. and then, you know, this anti-war Congress came in and one of the first substantive votes they took was to cut off all supplemental appropriations to the South Vietnamese Army. There was, that was, there was no reason for that. Well, our, our forces weren't even on the ground over there. And at the same time, the North Vietnamese refurbished and they, they attacked them when they were repositioning. They had to reposition. Mm -hmm. I, I, have, I have a really great friend, you know, um, uh, who, uh, when I was listening to your show, they were talking about the American uh, who had spent nine years as a prisoner of mm -hmm. war, uh, 
Lekau, uh, who's here now, uh, spent 12 years on the battlefield, was a regimental commander at age 28, recipient of their uh, Medal of Honor, and in 13 and a half years locked up, five years on a conics box. Um, he was down to two artillery rounds per tube per day when he was trying to reposition his forces when this thing hit. So um, it was a very complicated war. I'm not trying to, like, you know, re, uh, you know, reimagine what was happening, but I had always thought that the, the end result would probably be kind of like what you see in Iraq, just sort of a slow down and sort things out rather than uh, what happened. Going back to the book, while my mother slept so fitfully and so fitfully dreamed, I was hit by two enemy grenades while clearing a series of well camouflaged bunkers. The bunkers were built inside a bamboo thicket at the edge of a murky stream bed. The first grenade peppered me lightly on the face and shoulders. The second detonated behind me just after I shot the man who threw it and a second soldier who was inside the same bunker. I was hit in the head, back, arm, and leg. The grenade's concussion lifted me into the air and threw me down a hill into the stream. I still carry shrapnel at the base of my skull and in one kidney from the blast. But the square quarter-sized piece that scored the inside of my left knee joint and lodged against the bone of my lower leg would eventually change the direction of my life. Having for months repeatedly seen far worse among many of my Marines, I did not pay a great deal of attention to my wounds. Medevaced into Al Hoa, I was treated for several days at the battalion aid station. Some of the shrapnel in the back of, in my head, back and arm was removed, and some was left to work its way out naturally as my skin healed over time, the scars pushing shrapnel out onto the surface. I returned to the bush as soon as possible, but the leg wound went deep into the joint and had not completely healed. In the muck of the rice paddies and the filth of the basin, vills, it soon became infected. I did not know it at the time, but the infection was moving into the bone, causing permanent septic damage. And then you go to, uh, in August, your company executive officer, he lets you know that there's a billet opened up for Force Service Regiment on Okinawa. And for those people that don't know what it is, this is like a plush billet. And here you go. If I accepted the assignment for me, the Vietnam War would be over within weeks. And, the, and an assignment on the quaint and gorgeous island of Okinawa would give me several months to decompress from battlefield combat before I returned home. Life's gambles are sometimes settled in mere moments, weighed against years of previous thought and decades on the other side where one might reflect on the wisdom involved in a sudden decision. I listened to the executive officer and fought inside myself pressing the radio handset against my face as I leaned against an old grave in the middle of a desolate village. Those few seconds became, as they like to say in the Marine Corps, a teachable moment. But I could not say yes. After all the years of preparation and months of hardship that I had endured with one infantry battalion in this small but violent section of a seemingly never-ending war, I could not simply walk away. Bonds formed on the battlefield are often as unbreakable as the strongest family ties. In a word, I felt obligated. Like my father, service to country defined my self-respect. More to the point, I loved leading infantry marines. With a gritty elan, they faced the gravest dangers. They took the greatest risks. They absorbed the highest casualties. They had f the fewest creature comforts but they also stood face to face and toe to toe with the enemy every day. And they answered in their honor to no one. Taking a deep breath, I finally said no and stayed in the bush. In September, I was given command of dying Delta. No complaints. You know, it's um, 
during that time, um, I had served under four battalion commanders and three regimental commanders. Um, and as you know, I mean, as I'd say, majority of the people who who go through th- this experience know uh, there are there are a few bonds in your life tighter than the, the people um, that you have served with under extraordinary circumstances. I, I, I once wrote in, in one article, I don't say I would trust my life to these people because I already have. Uh, and I knew, I knew what I was doing. You know, I, I knew the terrain. I felt like I belonged there. There's a, there's a scene in Fields of Fire where Snake, was a squad leader, uh, they're getting ready to go on an operation. He goes and sits on a bunker uh, looking out across the paddies at the at the fog pouring down the mountains and says, you know, yeah, this is this is where I belong, you know. And um, my third regimental commander who uh, was a real piece of work, name was Noble Beck, uh, pulled me in. He he found out I had two purple hearts as an officer in the bush and which was against the division order. And as he as he said um, when I left Vietnam, he said, this guy came in with tears as big as horse turds in his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the greatest job I've ever had is being a rifle company commander, just enough independence to really be innovative and, but still totally connected with your people. And I've been very privileged um, in, in, in my life to be able to maintain – uh, contact not only with the people that, that I, uh, many of the people that I served with, but also with the operating military. Uh, and I, I learned when I, uh, when I was in law school, I, you know, that's where I finally ended up because um, I needed to figure I need to screw my brain on and figure out, <laughs> you know, the rest of my life. Um, I found out that I could make money by writing. You know, it was like the pure formula here. You know, I could actually get people to pay me to indulge my curiosities, and uh, so I was able. I was able, among other things, to, you know, to be with the military, our military, in a lot of different places. I was in Beirut uh, in 1983 uh, when I covered it for PBS, um, and actually, I I left right before the building blew up. I I stop every year. Uh, October 23rd and think about that. That was a good battalion, 1st Battalion, 8th Marines. You know, you've been around this long enough, you can smell a good good unit and you can tell a bad unit, and they were a good unit. They were well-led. Um, I uh, was able to be in Afghanistan, you know, as, a, as an embed over there. Um, spent, been able to spend time working on veterans' issues. Spent five years in the Pentagon. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can take this sort of, you know, affiliation and camaraderie and, and have it still help in other things you do in your life. So that was, uh, that was it, right? When, uh, when the colonel brought you in and he just said, hey, look, I don't care, you're going home, you're, you're out. You're, you're not going to stay here anymore. And there was no, I, I, no I ifs, ands, or buts about that I, one. No, there was not. Um, <laughs> you know, he, as soon as he found out, I had two Purple Hearts. Um, and I, I was on the uh, regimental in the regimental three shop for my last two months, and then came home, and then I started, you know, my uh, situation with the the joint and my legs started acting up after I got home. And, and by the way, you you wrote this whole book, and you spent I think it was a half or maybe a quarter paragraph or maybe three sentences talking about you attacking enemy bunkers, throwing grenades in, getting wounded, fighting on. Um, that's that's the that's that's what you received the Navy Cross for, and um, well, I just wanted to point out that that's uh, that takes humble to a new level for you to write this book and well, give yourself a, a sentence or two. You know, I, I uh, when I when I decided to write Fields of Fire, uh, I was I was in law school. Um, there was a. You know, there, there's a very important concept that stuck in my mind, and it's still there, and, and that is that the people who went over and interrupted their lives, a lot of them just spent one one tour in, in the Marine Corps and went home, have never 
been fully appreciated. I've never been fully understood, you know, and what they did, getting that down, you know, the, the environment in which they served and, you know, the, the, there's a, when we talk about courage, there's physical courage, which is maybe shooting somebody in a bunker. I don't know. There's moral courage, which is standing up for what you believe in and having the courage to say it to those above you. And sometimes you have to say it to those who are, who are below you. You know, no, you got to do this. That's all there is to it. And then there's what I like to call daily courage. You know, and daily courage is taking a hand God dealt you and doing something with it. You know, uh, like Tom Martin, who uh, was one of my squad leaders, was a, he's now passed away. Uh, he was an interesting uh, he, 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 he was an interesting ear for me in the bush. He had been at Van, Vanderbilt University, was in favor of the war. I was in a debate on the war, and this guy who supposedly was going to Canada turned around and said, if you think this is such a great war, why don't you just go serve in it? And he enlisted, so he was a very, very smart, knowing guy. He could, you know, when things would get down, he'd come and talk, talk to me about different stuff. Then he got shot. Um, and he used to keep, a, you know, everybody had this Zippo lighter, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, with your slogan on it, and his 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 uh, slogan was "Life is not in drawing a good hand, but learning to play a poor hand well," um, and that takes daily courage. You know, and we had in our in our platoon um, had two triple amputees. One one died uh, before they got him out of Vietnam. Uh, but Dale Wilson was the other one. Was a, a Silver Star recipient one of the most positive people I've ever met. Uh, if you if you met him, you wouldn't, you would know that he had, had lost an arm, but you wouldn't, you know, he'd be leaning on a cane. You wouldn't be able to tell he'd lost one leg up by the thigh or above the thigh and the other one down below. And he, it takes Dale Wilson 15 minutes to get out of bed. That's daily courage. And he never, never complains. He'll, you know, he'll say, well, I was going to be in the NFL. What else, to, <laughs> what else should I be doing here? <laughs> Mac McGarvey, arm blown off, right below the shoulder. Uh, got, went out and got a tattoo that says cut on dotted line. <laughs> when I ran for the Senate, when I decided to run for the Senate nine months to the day before the election, with zero money, zero st- campaign staff, I just said I'm going to do this. First guy I called was McGarvey. He was the, the night manager of Tootsie's Orchid Lounge in Nashville, Tennessee. And I said, man, I need somebody I can trust. You know, 24 hours a day, you got to be my driver. He says, I got one arm. I said, I don't care. You're my driver. Uh, he quit his job, moved into our basement for a year. And, uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't have done it without him. He's a great, great friend of mm-hmm. son Jim's, too, by the way. So that's, that's daily courage, you know. And that's, you know, that's really when you look at the ramifications of that place and having people understand, you know, what, how this – was in many ways positive for our country too. Uh, that's my goal. So, you, so you're in law school, and you know you've, you've mentioned this a couple times so far. But at some point, you decide, okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start writing. Why did you decide to write a novel instead of write a book of your own experiences? And I mean, I know, and I'm gonna get into it a little bit. I mean, clearly there's a major amount of crossover. But is there a specific reason why you said, you know what, I'm gonna write a novel instead of a, a, a memoir? Well, there's two things. I started writing my last year in the Marine Corps. I, I was put on the Secretary of the Navy staff and I was on this medical hold. And I, you know, I, as, as we discussed earlier, I was an avid reader. I loved, I loved to write. I was writing for my job. I wrote three um, uh, magazine articles in that year. One of them was very controversial. It was about the uh, roles and missions of the Marine Corps how they were on paper an amphibious force and they were doing all these other things and it did it make a difference and my bottom line was you better believe it makes a difference uh there's not one marine general on any of these j staffs anywhere except that you know if, if the navy gives them one and the marine corps wasn't even represented when they decided that that was their mission it was the chief of naval operations and i was 25 years old and i got in big trouble you think i got in big trouble in some of these other things i've written you know the chief of staff of the marine corps was calling me into talking to me and the commandant ordered a counter article to be written uh, about what i had said because they they were being accused in a jcs of you know this you know wanting to start some sort of a campaign you know um so i learned the power of the written word and then i wrote uh my first year in law school, I, I started looking, and I started looking at Micronesia, 
And what's going to happen after the Vietnam War? What should the United States basing system look like in the in the Pacific? And I was reading a lot of World War II stuff, and you know, Rommel in the desert was you know fighting from what he called the interior position, you know, logistically shortening logistic lines, being able to hit the Brits when they were after him and hit the Americans when they were after him. And I said, we need to, to develop an interior position in in Pacific Asia, and that's Guam Tenian. I got really kind of into this. I wrote my first book actually about that, and went out and worked. Uh, for the governor of Guam doing a, a study. So then I'm saying, I'm, I'm listening to the stuff that people were saying about those who served. I think I met three people in three years in Georgetown Law School who had been in combat in Vietnam. Hmm. 1,800 people, student body, same age group. Something was wrong. And I actually was sitting in constitutional law class when they were debating the War Powers Act, and it got to be very vicious on, uh, you know, the people who served there. And all the stuff they'd never said to my face, they're saying to each other in this class. I'm going, holy shit, that's what they really believe. And I started writing the last chapter of Fields of Fire sitting in constitutional law class. And then as I wrote it, you know, the first time, I wrote this book seven times cover to cover. You had an engineering degree, you know. And, and I'm, you know, I, I never went to a creative writing class. I started reading the people I thought were the greats. Um, in a different way, not for enjoyment, but for structure and these sorts of things. Hemingway, Steinbeck, Faulkner, uh, Graham Greene, uh, the British and the Irish poets, etc. Um, so the first time through, it was sort of like just, you know, it was a very good catharsis. Mm-hmm. And then I got to the point where I said, no, I've got a piece of literature here. Uh, every one of these characters is a little bit different, and it is an escalating moral drama uh, in terms of how they are reacting to, to operating in this particular area. Um, and so the, the power, the literary power of the novel was, was more important than me telling a, I was there kind of story. Uh, it had a universality to it. And uh, Ted you know, Purdy, uh, who came in to help me on this, uh, who had, quote, discovered Leon Uris, was editor-in-chief of Putnam at one time, uh, uh, just really encouraged me to stay with it, and I, you know, I'm very lucky that I did because the book survived, you know, twelve rejections and everything else, and is still out there. No, so uh, I, and and honestly, I I kind of answered that question for myself, and I think when people read it, they'll figure out wh- why you did it because it does. It has this power to it that you couldn't have done um, just writing your own story, even though your own story is is very similar and has probably parts that are just even more impactful but the way that this ties together and this is this is like the iconic novel and i will say about vietnam war but really like you could put this over just war and you got these characters in it you you know you, you already talked about one of them you got snake who's like the street smart kind of badass marine you got lieutenant robert E. Lee Hodges, who's who's the lieutenant. You got the senator, who's this Harvard kid that thought he was going to play the French horn in the Marine Corps band, and he ends up in in the basin. Uh, uh, you got Catman, who's the the Mexican point man. You got the Terp, uh, the interpreters we call them. Uh, um, Dan. You got Cannonball, Flaky, Bagger, Rabbit, uh, Gilliland, Baby Cakes. Sergeant Austin's and and all these characters and and you know as I read this it was just You know, I probably read this 10 years ago or something maybe 15 years ago and when I read it again I mean, it's just infinitely I mean just because I'm older and I understand things more I guess I hope but just the way that Each one of these characters and and here's something that I realized as I was reading this book first of all, we know these characters like these characters, they exist in real life. They exist in combat. They enlisted. They exist in the SEAL teams. They exist in the Marine Corps. They exist in the Army. I met all these characters. They're all out there, and they're all out there. I work with businesses now. They're in those businesses as well. They're in. They're, these are human beings, and and that's incredible. And then you put them in this. You know, again, I'm I'm interested always in learning about human nature. But you put them in in this environment that is what you've talked about, and this environment is going to is going to reveal human nature in incredible ways and you just capture so much of it and I mean I want to take a look at when when uh, Hodges kind of arrives in Vietnam 
and he sits down with Major Otto. So here we go. This is Fields of Fire. Going back to the book, Major Otto, the battalion executive officer, sat behind his field desk and examined Hodge's record book. He was young for a major in his early 30s. He seemed pleasant enough to Hodges, who had expected a hatchet-faced, ravening warrior after hearing of the major's background. Otto had been a company commander during his first tour and was highly decorated. His right forearm was gashed with a six-inch purple trough left by a bone-shattering machine gun bullet. And yet he had the inquisitive, sensitive demeanor of a brooding scholar. He smiled casually to Hodges. So, you think you're ready? Hodges stood at a loose parade rest in the musty heat of the tent. He was scheduled to attend three more days of regimental indoctrination school, but he had not found it helpful, and he had learned to hate the dust-filled boredom of Anawa. Yes, sir, I'm ready. Think so? Good. They need you out there. Lost another lieutenant last night. The major watched him closely. Yes, sir, I heard. Yeah, good old dying Delta. They like to call themselves Deadly Delta. (laughs) Otto chuckled. He had a beaten tone in his voice as if he had seen the ritual so many times it had lost its meaning. Deadly Dying Delta. Hodges watched him, dripping with sweat in the dark heat. Outside, a jeep rumbled past, leaving a wave of red dirt that seeped underneath the tent flap like a creeping frog. In the distance, an artillery battery an artillery battery fired a mission towards the Arizona Territory. The Major swiped at a fly, then lit a cigarette. As an afterthought, he offered one to Hodges. No thank you, sir. Major Otto sighed. You'll learn. He dragged deeply on the cigarette, frankly studying Hodges. Yeah, dying Delta. You're not ready, Lieutenant. The only reason I'm telling you is I don't want you to panic when you get out there and find out. Nothing in your entire goddamn life will have prepared you for the bush. Not a damn thing. Yes, sir. Do you know what I mean? No, sir. Jesus Christ. The Major dragged again on his cigarette. Deadly Delta. Yeah. They really caught the shit last night. I watched it. It was almost embarrassing to admit. He still felt uncomfortable about the irony of sitting on a bunker and watching someone else's war. Otto leaned forward, absently rubbing the purple gash on his forearm. Well, what kind of person do you think goes through that shit day in and day out, Lieutenant? Because that's what it is. Shit. And that's the way you take it. Every stinking day. Some, something piddly ass or something heavy. This isn't World War II where we can pull you out to Australia and parade after a month of fighting. Nope, and it isn't 1965. When we first came into Vietnam, we would send a company out on a two-day operation, then bring the men back for hot chow and liberty. Yeah, that's right. Liberty, Lieutenant, in Da Nang. Then we started week-long operations. Then it was a month. Now, well, we just leave them out there all the time. It's more convenient. The Major offered Hodges a small, challenging smile. They go wild, Lieutenant. And there's nothing you can do about it. You'll go wild, too. Wild as hell. You spend a month in the bush and you're not a Marine anymore. Hell, you're not even a goddamn person. There's no tents, no barbed wire, no hot food, no jeeps or trucks, no clean clothes, nothing. You're an animal. It gets so that it's natural to squat when you take a shit. You get ringworm and hookworm and gook sores. You roll around in your own filth. You forget how bad you smell. Dead people, guts in the goddamn dirt, miserable civilian. It all gets sort of boring. You cry when your friends are killed, but a new friend comes on a helicopter a few days later, and the dead friend becomes enshrined, a martyr to friendship. You teach the new friend about him, and you all remember him. It's very romantic. It doesn't sound very romantic. That's after a month or two. But, Lieutenant, when you do it for six or nine or even longer, by Christ, you'll never shake it. The bush gets in your blood, and you hate anyone who hasn't fermented in his own stench for months or stood inside a dirt hole all night waiting to kill a man who's trying to kill him first. Major Otto scrutinized Hodges. Oh, yeah. I've done a lot of thinking about it. That's something a grunt isn't supposed to do. He chuckled again, a sort of dry bark. But what else can a man do in Anhoa? Oh, and it becomes an oasis. You like Anhoa, Lieutenant? I hate it. You'll like it when you get back from the bush, I guarantee. 
So, what kind of person can take it for months on end? Hodges felt uneasy. He'd expected the Major to wave the flag and talk about Iwo Jima and then send him aboard the resupply helicopter with fire in his heart. Someone who is very dedicated, sir. Either that or someone who is very crazy. Well, there you are. That's in a nutshell. You just hit the nail on the goddamn head. (laughs) (laughs) It's been a long time since I read that book. Yeah. uh, that but, uh, uh, I mean, it's it's the iconic it's the iconic conversation between the new lieutenant and the executive uh, officer, and you you just nailed it. I guess I'm I'm, I'm lucky I wrote that when I was 28. <laughs> 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 no, I look I I wanted there there are, there are a couple things here. When it, when I started, I said I am not going to write this book unless the third guy down in the third fire team says this is true this is real i mean you know true real however you want to put it this is real Um, and that was my guidepost in terms of all of the the combat sequences and 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 this this sort of thing is you don't want to go through this and have it be dear author i love you signed author or (laughs) the way i wish it had been uh, or you know the way I would like to present it. I remember when the when the book came out, there was a uh, a Marine three star uh, general who had been very helpful when I was trying to help one of one of my former Marines who uh, had had been out in this area, and I sent him a copy of the the proofs, and he summoned me. I was <laughs> working on the hill. He summoned me to his quarters in Eighth and I, and he said, "This could be a primer on Marine Corps tactics, but these were not my Marines." And I went, he was a colonel when he was over there. And I said, sir, I don't know what to tell you because that's as honest as I can be. Um, and they were my Marines. And I don't have to try to make it Iwo Jima to, to give, give respect to the, to the people who were there. But I'll tell you what, I walked out of that uh, meeting with him thinking, oh, my God, you know, this is going to be really bad if, you know, the, the, the Marine Corps turns on me for writing a book about mm-hmm. Marines. And then there was another two-star uh, – General Schultz, uh, who had been a battalion commander and been on Taylor Common, he was in, with Third Marine Division, but he'd been on Taylor Common down here. He he read the book and he called me. He read it on a C-130 from you know Andrews to Pendleton. He called me. He said, "This is the book. This is the book." I said, "Will you send me a letter, sir?" <laughs> <laughs> and I sent. He sent me a letter, and uh, so when I had this little. Uh, you know, a command visit to General Wilson, who was the commandant, when the, when the book came out, I'm going, boy, I'm, I'm really nervous about this. General Wilson was a hard ass, you know. And uh, so I got in to see General Wilson. I give him, a, give him a copy of the book, and I said, and this is what General Schultz thinks about it. <laughs> <laughs> and over time, you know, it's it been mandatory reading and the commandant's reading list for decades. And I can't tell you how many letters I've gotten from me, particularly staff and COs. You know, I remember when I was in Beirut, uh, and you know, as a, as a journalist there in '83, there was a, there was one uh, gunnery sergeant who came and he told me, "I have read your book eleven times. It is a text on, you know, on leadership. Mm-hmm. If you really read it, and and at the same time, the, the the important thing also is if you're if you're going to write a novel that lasts, you want that universality. As you say, this isn't just Vietnam; it's just isn't my experience, um, and so. It really is a very carefully drawn moral drama. Um, and, you know, some of these passages you're reading, I haven't heard them in years, and I still remember because I've written some of these 25 times. You know, the, the, the one you start off with, I knew the words. You know, I knew the words that were going to come out of your mouth. Uh, so that is, you know, that was my intention of the, with, with the book. And, uh, you know, what can I say? It's still out there, and I'm, I, you know, it's as honest as I can be, and I know as you know, there are, there's it's a lot of rough spots in this book, but I don't have to I don't have to put it any differently. The other, one other thing I will say is the dialogue, it maybe from the, having benefited from living in so many different places and whatever, the dialect is you know carefully accurate in like seven or eight different American dialects and the way they say words in there. So. Yeah, for sure. No, you, you, you nail that. And it's very clear um, that, yeah, you know these people. 
you know, that, that, that you were able to capture it. You also did a great job, obviously, of capturing some, some of the just straight combat. And I'm going to go here just to one little situation. Suddenly there were loud explosions across the river. The northern compound literally erupted. Recoilless rifles flashed and boomed again and again, their explosions raising clouds of dirt inside the compound. Machine guns and small arms hammered at the Marines. The two platoon perimeter fought back. Red and green tracers interlaced, careening into the black air, making weaving patterns in the night. The artillery battery on the bridge compound reacted. It turns its guns north and lobbed dozens of projectiles across the river, seeking to silence the attack. New bright flashes, hazes of dust, grouped around the northern compound. Then a moment of anticipatory lull. Goodrich knew what was about to happen. He wished he could tell them in the bridge compound. He wished he could dig a hole in the dirt and come back out in California. Watch out, he groaned inwardly, too afraid to cry. Oh shit, here it comes. Right now. An avalanche of mortar rounds timed from a dozen tubes to land together on the southern compound. Then, just above the stranded team, the deep pops of heavy machine gun. Goodrich listened to himself whimper. He could not stifle it. It seemed to him a scream that would give them all away. But he finally realized it was no more than a scratchy, whispering whine. The bridge compound's defenders were caught unaware, having to feel like spectators in the northern compound's furious defense. Bodies went flat inside their bunkers, seeking cover from the mortar barrage. As they did, streams of sappers poured through the outer wire, sliding pipes of Bangalore torpedoes to clear pathways through the concertina. For a moment, they were unnoticed, the explosions they created blending in with the mortars. They broke through both sides of the J-shaped hill, just at its hook, tossing satchel charges of explosives into the nearest bunkers. Half of the bunkers on the artillery side, unmanned as their defenders had helped with the fire missions on the north compound, were quickly taken by the NVA. The rest of the perimeter swarmed with creeping, dashing sappers. Two bunkers were lost just down from 3rd Platoon's last position. The sappers manned the bunkers after killing the occupants with satchel charges and provided a beachhead on the lines. A stream of shadows poured into the compound between the bunkers. The first cell of NVA that raced past the bunkers burned an entrance with a whooshing flamethrower. It ignited the corner of a nearby tent and drew bright red answers from a host of rifles fired from nearby bunkers. There was no second whoosh. Its trigger manned and its mate lay dead beside low smolders from the torch-lit tent. Another sapper team crept quietly into the center of the compound and encountered two almost identical bunkers. In its haste, it demolished the chapel, leaving the, compound, leaving the command center bunker unscathed. After the chapel exploded in detonation that raised a blight, bright flash and leveled the bunker in a smoking heap, another fierce mortar barrage shook the hill. The North Vietnamese would attempt to take out more bunkers, consolidate, then retreat through the breaks in the, they had made in the wire. Speedy's gun team cringed in the stream bed, unspeaking, wincing as the gun cut loose again. Its explosion seemed to be so close that one could reach up a hand and lose it to a bullet. Each man knew that if he were made an, unward, an untoward move, revealing himself in any way, the whole team would not last five minutes. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to hide. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the... Uh, have you read Anton Meyer? Anton Meyer's books? I have not. Once an Eagle? I have not. Uh, when we... when the Actually, I think I have read Once an Eagle. Yeah, it's a great, great book. You know, when, when, uh, when we sent the proofs around on on uh, fields they you know Prentice Hall didn't quite know what to expect uh, they you know the book had been rejected by 12 publishers <laughs> nobody wanted to see this side of it uh, and the the editor-in-chief of Prentice Hall John Kirk had been a, a naval aviator in in the Korean War he was a Harvard graduate which I, I thought was kind of interesting because when he asked me to come and talk to him he asked me to meet him at the Harvard Club and, you know Goodrich is the Harvard <laughs> goof you know um, but he said I think this can be the great novel you know he, he said the the, the the great novels of different wars go against the grain of prevailing orthodoxy um, and he made a deal with me he said uh, you know I'll give you five thousand dollars I've been working on this for four years he give you five thousand dollars I'll print five thousand copies uh, but I will put your book on the cover of Publishers Weekly, and I'll send you on a major tour. And I said, you know, done. And uh, he said, actually, the draft he had only had a, like a, a 
a five-page epilogue on Goodrich. And he said, I'd actually like to see more of Goodrich coming back. I said, would you like the 28-page version, the 35-page version, or the 62-page version? <laughs> so let me look at that. I gave him like the 30-page version, but, uh, typed page version back. But then they started sending the, the book around um, before publication date for advanced quotes, and he got a torrent of them. You know, and the one one of the uh, the advanced quotes that I treasured the most was from Anton Meyer. Um, he had been uh, he also was a Harvard guy, but he'd been a, a Marine in World War II. Uh, had been on uh, either Guadalcanal or Iwo Jima, was wounded, um, and wrote Once an Eagle, which um, is a marvelous book. Yeah, it's kind so, of America's. So I, I, no, I haven't read that. America's War and book. Peace is like a thousand pages long, but he. Uh, you know, he he took uh, one character, well, actually two characters, but from before World War One all the way into Vietnam. Although he didn't call it Vietnam in his book, um, and you know, one of them was a you know a, a Nebraska farm kid who was uh, enlisted and you know and he got a battlefield commission in World War One, and the other was a you know West Point guy who punched all the buttons exactly right. His name was Massengale. The other one was <laughs> Sam Davin, um, but. He wrote really good combat scenes, and I, I, and I and I loved his book. And he sent when he when he sent he sent this long advanced quote on this book, and I, you know I just of, of all of them I went wow you know he said here at last is the the real story of those who are in Vietnam you know devoid of histrionics et cetera et cetera um, and uh, you know et, et, et cetera but that. You know, when when you read passages like that, I think of uh, you know people like him, um, you know, reacting to this gamble, you know, that at, at the time because there was nothing out like this at the time. No, this, this was is... the first revisionist novel, and I'll tell you, when I went on my tour, um, I'd spent a year and a half on. I was working on the House Veterans Committee, developing w- w- what I w- sort of a, a factual basis for discussion on, on the Vietnam War. You know, how long did people really serve? How many were draftees? How many were volunteers? What what was the makeup of the casualties, you know, uh, and those who served, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just trying to lay the whole thing out year by year. So I went out and the shows that I did, that's what I wanted to talk about. You know, I, I would talk about this other stuff. Um, but there were, you know, I had some real moments. And also, by the way, I had been representing a so-called war criminal pro bono from my, my first year in law school, mm-hmm. who I, I represented for six years. Uh, he committed suicide halfway through. I cleared his name I, I, finally after six years. But that wasn't very popular uh, out there. But uh, I had a, I was on a radio show in Boston, and uh, in the middle of the show, this guy s- stopped. He said, I can't, I can't hold this back any longer. Don't you consider yourself to be a murderer? Um, I mean, I went, no, and actually, what I said ended up being the intro on uh, the American rifleman shot or whatever. I said, no, man is by nature a violent animal, and society puts restrictions. You know, like let me, let me give you A B C here. You know, society puts restrictions on how that violence is used, and I don't consider myself to be a murderer any more than you know a police officer. Okay, so, and I had I was on uh, Good Morning Boston, and the woman who produced you so nice to me, et cetera. Right before I go on the show, she said, "We used to hate you guys." I said, "What?" She said, "No, really, I mean hate you." And I went, "Oh, thank you for that." And I'm now going with the screaming wolf here, you know. Um, and it's interesting because uh, I did a show in I think it was Cincinnati, which was a TV show. Speaking about the passage you just read, right a little further in that passage, there is a. Uh, a sequence where there's a uh, an enemy soldier who is in the trapped in the wire, mm-hmm. and he's all you know like kind yep. of blown away, and he starts yelling "Chu Hoi!" I said, "Chu Hoi! Chu Hoi! Chu Hoi!" And somebody yelled "Shut up!" and shot him. <laughs> and this woman who was interviewing me, she says, "How can you put that in a book? You know, somebody who was trying to surrender who was shot." And uh, I said, "Well, look, you know, this this is the reality of what what was going on." So she says, "I want to put that to a vote." And she asked the viewers, how many of you agree with him? 94% of them agreed with me. I think, <laughs> gee, I think maybe we're starting to get somewhere here. You know, not, you know, not uh, lionizing, shooting wounded soldiers, but, you know, I mean, reality is reality. You know, it is indeed. Once you touch them, then it's different, you know. But, uh, 
and speaking of reality being reality and this is uh, to, to kind of point out uh, some of the reality that's in this book I got w- one more thing I want to read from it <sighs> how'd you like to stay in on Okinawa <laughs> sir that's right the major smiled Jesus lieutenant I thought you would have jumped over the desk by now I'm on the level we just had a billet open up over at special services recreation officer a lieutenant rotated early on emergency leave he had less than 90 days on his tour so he'll be reassigned from the states I have the authority to fill the bill billet from the transients who've been in country already your ideal combat time hospital time would you like it the major jibed him grinning good duty lots of free time stick around Hodges we will turn you into a whoremongering drunk <laughs> a simple yes and the war would be over but so would everything else and for the first time he confronted the truth yes major thank you sir and the rest of his life would be anti climax there was nothing on the other side what does a man do when his war is over wondered Hodges except keep fighting it all expectancies then lived and if not fulfilled well at least confronted The bald red hills with their sandbag bunkers, the banter and frolic of dirt-covered grunts, the fearful intensity of contact. It was too deep inside him, and he had not yet done enough to be free of it. He suddenly felt superior to the major, a creature apart, capable of absorbing combat's horror without asking for quarter. Down south, his men were on patrol, or digging new perimeters, or dying, and he was nothing if he did not share that misery. He stared deep into the Major's face, enjoying the one moment of nobility that his months of terror had allowed. Thanks, Major, but I didn't come halfway around the world to referee basketball games. The the most powerful and telling scene or one of the most powerful and telling scene, scene, telling scenes in the novel is the way that I originally ended it which is which is with uh, Mitsuko taking her son you know, to Camp Hansen mm-hmm. and she's on the one hand she's trying to exp- you know to, to build uh, some positive feelings in him about the father he never knew and the, the, the price that he was paying for being half American in, in the Okinawan society. And and she says, was this a, he says, you know, she takes him to Camp Hansen, you know, because he can, she can see the Marines there, he can see the Marines in there. And he says, was was a good thing? Am I like them? Then I will be a warrior. You know, and, and that's like, whoa, you know. Um, and then when I was in the Senate, this is very ironic, we actually had a situation on, on Okinawa, which was an exact replay, um, where I was able to help uh, a family, a Marine, um, who had deployed to Iraq and uh, found out that his fiance was pregnant and they arranged um, for them to be married on the phone. And they had immigration issues and kid issues and all this stuff. And my counsel, Trevor Mm Moe, was, when he was was handling this, I I gave him a copy of Fields of Fire. (laughs) (laughs) It was kind of amazing coincidence. Speaking of sons, I wanna go here back to, uh, I heard my country calling, talking about as you were, as you were heading off to Vietnam. I would soon drive west, heading for California, where Barbara would rent a house across the street from my granny, and I would catch a flight to Vietnam. My parents would clear their quarters at Andrew Air Force Base, and then head south to stay for a while with my dad's longtime friend, Bud Caldwell, as they adjusted to the unknowns of retirement that awaited them in Florida. Alpha had just begun. Omega was, not so happily, done. In less than 20 years, our lives had traveled full circle. I was now the one who was leaving. My dad was the one being left behind. There was nothing left to say. It was time to go. We rose from the years-worn couches and began to say our final, deliberate, understated, 
goodbyes. We slowly made our way toward the front door of the farmhouse. The radio in the dining room began playing Danny Boy, sung by Johnny Cash. I'm not sure that anyone other than God himself could have arranged the sweet sorrow of that moment. Johnny Cash was my favorite singer. Danny Boy, emblematic of our long-held Scots-Irish heritage of military service, is perhaps the greatest song ever written about the painful anguish of a father watching helplessly as his son marches off to war. Oh, Danny Boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen and down the mountainside. The summer's gone and all the roses falling. Tis you, tis you must go and I must bide. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow or when the valley's hushed and white with snow. Tis I'll be here in sunshine or in shadow. Oh, Danny boy, oh, Danny boy, I love you so. It was the first and only time I ever saw my father cry. Yeah. And then, 30 odd years later, you're sending your son into the Marine Corps. The Iraq War is escalating, because this is what, 2003? Uh, I joined in early 2005. Oh, so yeah, it's full escalation mode mm-hmm. at this point. And you're going through the same thing. That's harder going through it. <clears throat> I think um, it's it's harder having a loved one gone than it is being gone emotionally. I think um, you know. Uh, my dad was gone a lot. Yeah. Um, I never expected that he would react that way, you know. Um, and then when you know when Jim was gone, you know it was uh, it was hard for a lot of reasons. Um, partly because I was out there campaigning part of the time, and this was a very private thing to me. I'm a father. I refuse to talk about it other than in in general terms. Um, but. Uh, He was able to call every now and then and send send emails and that sort of thing. And actually, that, that made it a little harder, <laughs> you know, because you're getting a bit in a piece here. Yeah. yeah. Um, we had uh, just as a, as an anecdote, I got to make like I think three phone calls from from Vietnam um, <sighs> when you get back in Anwa. Uh, you know, on these Mars radio stations where you have three <laughs> minutes, you stand on you got three minutes, and you got it, you say something, and you go over, and then they talk on the other end. So I go. <laughs> Hey, hey, mom! I'm I'm here in Vietnam. Over, okay. over where? <laughs> well, I gotta go now. You know. But you know, getting some of the bits and pieces of what's going on, and and you know, Jim was very, very well read and smart about that region. So he was seeing things even as a, a lance corporal that a lot of people weren't. That was tough. And then you know, truly waking up every morning and not knowing if your your kids alive. You know, I mean, that's the unknowns b- bother you. The unknowns and the partial knowns bother you more than actually being there, I think. But, yeah, it's very hard. But it's also our family way, you know. And uh, so um, when he came back, it was – I'll to tell you a funny story. <laughs> they got extended on the search. Yeah. You know, one six got extended Doing on the search. Such a good job, we got to stay longer. <laughs> yeah, and I think there was a, there was a lot of fist fights going on at that point. <laughs> there were, but uh, and, and Jim's never backed down from one. Anybody? But uh, so I finally said to him uh, an email. All right, when you get back, anything you want. And he says, um, Yankees and Red Sox, Fenway Park, May nineteenth. Yeah, and we have great, great friend, and I uh, got a lot of great friends and from South Boston, yeah. big Marine Corps community up there. And, the guy Tommy Lyons, who who was uh, ran the veterans programs up there, he got tickets, <laughs> and uh, not only that, but Jim and uh, one of his uh, company mates, who was from uh, Boston, they got off the the plane at Logan, and there was the state highway patrol waiting for them, nice. and a, like a squad car, or whatever I don't know what it was, but they had the <laughs> sirens going, coming to coming to Fenway, and uh, yeah, they couldn't have, that couldn't have been any better. 
Hey, Jim, so how, how old were you when you were like thinking to yourself, all right, um, I'm following in my dad's footsteps? Earliest I could think. There was uh, two things I wanted to be, professional baseball player and a Marine, both at the same time. <laughs> and when I was 13, a good friend of mine, uh, we were warming up for a baseball game, told me that could not happen. And so it became kind of a binary choice. And the, But the Marine Corps was always at the front. Uh, my dad had a rope hanging in the backyard the entire time we were growing up. I think it was one day he came home. I don't know how old I was, but I climbed it, got back down, and asked if I could be a Marine. And his, his reaction was that I needed to get in some sort of organized athletics immediately. <laughs> need to wait 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when, you were, when you were going in Ramadi, so you, you had paid attention to what was going on in Ramadi and you guys knew you were deploying there. I mean, Absolutely. the three eight had done an awesome job, and they take. I mean, they'd ta- obviously taken a ton of casualties, mm-hmm. um, as had the whole one one AD and the two two eight before them, and the and the the three eight actually overlapped between the you know they were there just like the first the five oh six they were there between when the two two eight left mm-hmm. the three eight stayed the the first the five oh six stayed some some of the other battalions stayed I think, but so you guys both knew how bad. Ramadi was when you were heading there right and it's uh that was if we go back to when we were announced that we were going there um I think you mentioned last night there was some rumor that we were going to go on a booze cruise there was going to be a reward <laughs> for our battalion having done some seriously good work in Fallujah and in Afghanistan and there was a uh, a fairly I don't want to say it was dejection because that would sound wrong but it was kind of a whoa moment mm-hmm. uh, because we had heard what was happening to 3-8 and they were in a serious fight and all the units that had been there before them had been serious fights and I tried to get as much information as I could about the place that I was going to be going and there wasn't much written quite yet there was a little bit yeah. about 2-4 uh, one of the first units, Marine units in there that was in, in print um, but in terms of press reports they were they were an eye opener um, I believe there was an embed with 3-8 where they were detailing an average day of patrolling with these guys hopping walls and talking about the uh, the average time to contact from leaving wherever you were was about five minutes. Mm-hmm. And it was it was an eye opener and and I was a boot at the time. Um and one of the one of the things that I would do would be would be get on Ogrish or Live Leak and I wanted to find some way to rationalize, you know, the TTPs of the enemy. Um, could I like? Could I see what they were setting up when they were videotaping these complex attacks, the IED strikes, and there was really no way to do it. Um, you get a 30-second clip of a gun truck getting hit or a complex ambush, and eventually, one of my friends at the time, uh, Cliff Collinsworth, um, he's passed. Um, you know, laid into me one night about doing that. It's like it's like you're not gonna learn a damn thing. <laughs> You're just gonna get wrapped up in a ball, knock it off. And I took his advice and just played video games. But, uh, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was, it was, it was interesting trying to get mentally prepared for it. Um, and I remember before we deployed, uh, I was in a hotel room with him, and one of the things that stood out, as you have all these things going on, as you know, where uh, particularly if it's your first deployment, you know, your family is trying to be there for you. There's a lot of emotions flowing around, and he he said, you know if you survive and that woke me up in a big way i had never thought that was going to be even a question and it was uh something that was relayed to me by not only my own father but by someone who had been through his own very serious combat experience um and uh as i try to kind of rehash all this in my head i was i was brought back to a book that you reviewed on vietnam a couple podcasts ago where this uh, new lieutenant was talking about getting ready to leave um, and you know how he was eating his meal the night before um, and there was absolutely no desire to be to have the meal to be involved with it his mind was somewhere else and the night before I deployed uh, my cousins lived in Jacksonville um, my dad took us out to, I believe it was sharpshooters and it's a burger joint favorite thing in the world cheeseburger um every year on my birthday my mom would make a special meal and i'd always ask for a cheeseburger and i got a bacon double cheeseburger and basically just stared at it and all i could think about was where i was going to be in 48 hours and how the world around me there 
was just going to keep going on. Um, and it was, uh, it's very interesting period. Um, although he did make me famous, uh, couple of months later because the next morning we're getting ready to go out and once again uh, Dale Wilson was there uh, triple amputee he actually walked up to our barracks room uh, the night before we deployed um, you know walk up to the second or third deck uh, nobody could tell he was triple amputee hung out in the barracks with my dad uh, and us for a bit and then in the next the uh, the next morning getting ready to go on the bus and somebody I guess it was a whiskey or moonshine um, <laughs> You're on. T- you're on. You're on the radio. Whiskey, uh, <laughs> and did uh, going away shots in the parking lot, and there was a nice picture of it. A couple months later, in Iraq, my company first sergeant pulls me aside. There's a New York Times article apparently about it. Um, really? Yeah. Oh, it was, I, it, I it, wish it was I should have researched better, and we could have read that on the, on the <laughs> podcast. It was, it was a mention. It wasn't anything crazy, but he's like, "Oh, really? Web drinking on the job?" It's like, uh Tell you one of the tough, the tough moments when it, when it, when it talk about being able to communicate. When I was campaigning for the Senate, and this was like a couple of weeks before the election, um, Jim called me and he just had three guys in his unit were killed. And so <laughs> I'm in his car, you know, getting ready to go to a football game, a big football game um, down in the Norfolk area. And I get that information, you know, and I'm like, what do you do? You know, you put it in a box, you bury the box, you go do your thing, and then you can come back and pull the box out. Mm-hmm. But, you know, getting that, and that's it, you know, like two or three minutes, and then walking out and having to do like two or three hours saying hello to people and not mentioning anything and whatever, that, you know, that was really hard when, when he was gone and when I was going through that. Let me ask you this, kind of a critical question. As a dad, I'm going to come at you right now. So... If my son was getting ready to go on deployment, I don't know if I'd say if you survive. I'm not sure I said that. I mean, you did. Uh, <laughs> Is that something? I mean, I, I can see why you'd say it to, uh, you know, as I'm sitting there trying to think about why would I tell my son that. The reason I would tell, if I was to tell my son that, it'd be because I would want him to stay sharp and on point the entire time and not take it for granted and uh, realize what's at stake. So that might be. I don't, I don't really remember the context in which I would have said that, but, uh, <laughs> you know. I mean that that's exactly how I took it. Yeah. It uh it stripped away the like all aspects of the relationship except marine to marine. And I've always been very cognizant of my dad's experience and reputation in the Marine Corps. Um and it was a very clear message that you know this is going to be different, you're not special and you'd better pay attention. Mhm. Um so you might not remember saying it, but it sounds like some good advice. I'll keep that one in my back pocket. Yeah, I, we're, there were a lot of words going back and forth when he was getting ready to <laughs> ship out. So, and we, and from from your perspective, having mm-hmm. grown up like with such a with such a focus on leadership in your family and the tradition in your family, and showing up as a lance corporal inside of a platoon, and having more awareness than mm-hmm. the normal Lance Corporal would have. Because I'll tell you, I mean, I, if, if I'm picturing myself when I'm 19 years old, if I was a Lance Corporal, I would have been a normal Lance Corporal. I would have been, you know, I wouldn't have had this sort of uh, elevated look at things. I mean, even having read your dad's book over mm-hmm. and over again and and just just that level of understanding. Uh, how did that, how did that, how did that set in your platoon? How did that set with you? Were you ever were you ever looking at your boss thinking or looking at your platoon commander thinking uh, did he listen to you did he talk to you did he know who you were did he w- was there anything like that they all knew um I think the uh, the best or the most amount of time I kept that off the skyline was two to three days no matter which <laughs> unit I was at uh, boot camp I got pulled out and paraded around and it wasn't until I started asking questions this was before they actually kicked off the training they're like hey this is this is Webb's kid um but uh I, I think it, it put an extra like extra demand, particularly once I hit the fleet marine forces, uh, for humility. Because I could have, you know, all the informal um training, if you like, in the world and it was world class. But at the same time I'm walking into an environment where I have not been there and done what these guys have done and I need to listen. Mm-hmm. Um and when the opportunity presents itself you know, then the the practical application of what I had learned growing up would be there. But until you mm-hmm. earn your stripes, you're nothing. 
Um, and uh, I think I'd put an extra layer on him. No, no question about it. Particularly mm-hmm. among the officers, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and, yeah. and the thing is, he's, Jim has really, really been smart and thoughtful uh, about that part of the world. Um, so he had a, you know, he had a lens on on what was going on that a lot of people at his level didn't have. Did you? Okay, here's a here's a here's another question that I'll throw at you. And we were talking about a, a little bit yesterday, but um, you know, and I covered. Chesty Puller and Lou Puller on this podcast, number one twenty one and number one twenty two. If you haven't listened to him, go listen to him. If you don't know that story, you should know it. Everyone should know it. But you know, Lou Lou Puller got severely wounded as Chesty Puller's son. You know that that's another thing that would just I, I can't imagine because you were friends with Lou Puller. Yes, it was. And you, you know, you told me a. A story yesterday about you and him arguing about the draft and his his thoughts about that and I, I can't imagine that at some level you're thinking to yourself well I know how I feel I know I'm patriotic I believe in service but this is my boy that's a hard choice everyone has to make um, you know, Lou, Lou Puller, by the way, I don't think I, we had a lot of debate, but I never really got into an argument with him. I, I, I want to say that clearly because he is such a decent, basically gentle guy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but we certainly, you know, we certainly had our, our disagreements about policy and service and, and, uh, and wars in general, I think, by, by the time he and I were hanging out. Uh, he was a really, really fine guy. Um, my, you know, for me, Jim going into the military, it's a part of a family tradition. Um, you accept the risk. There's a, an article I wrote for Parade Magazine years ago about a father still tending the grave of his son in Arlington. I used to walk by it all the time. And it's one of the most beautiful stories about father and son and duty and whatever. The father was wounded in World War II. And his son um, was wounded three times and killed in Vietnam, went back from Okinawa and was killed. And, um, you know, it's called the price of duty, and I actually mentioned Jim was really young when I wrote that piece, but I mentioned you know he had already said he wanted to be a marine, you know. So you don't want to take away from someone what they believe that they they should do personally and for the country. So I totally respect it, and then you just gotta put your hands inside the bobsled, you know. <laughs> uh, and you also, uh, I, I know we're. We're, we've been at it for a while, but the, the one other thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, I talk about Hackworth a lot, and I know you, you interviewed him and spent, you spent like a week with him on Australia? No, I actually... Or Hawaii? I was, yeah, I was thinking I would get the gig to go to Australia, but we <laughs> met in Hawaii, which is not a bad, <laughs> not a bad second, uh, second place. Uh, uh, I spent about a week with him. Um, when he was, you know, I guess people who listen to you know, know his backstory, but when he was... Um, deciding to come home from Australia uh, after his exile for a number of reasons uh, and, and his book had not yet come out and um, Parade Magazine could not review books but I went and did a feature a long feature one of the longest pieces they'd done on, on him and and you know read about him be, beforehand talked to people knew him and then uh, got to know him pretty well kept up with him for years actually and he was a he was the kind of soldier that if you are going into a bad place you want to be with you know he was the real deal and and he had a hard time at the end for a number of reasons that i pointed out in 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 the article um i i phrased it in a certain way in my article you know um uh, i think it was a quote from um one of the people who served with him that you know, he, the army disappointed him, and he just decided to declare war on the <laughs> army. <laughs> but he was a soldier, and uh, yeah, I, I thought a lot of, of him in that part of his life. Yeah, yeah well, it's uh, some of the stuff you told me, and I and I read that article, and Jim, thanks for forwarding that to mm-hmm. me. And I had actually read it before, mm-hmm. um, but I hadn't made the connection. You know, I, I didn't look at the author's name. I apologize. Really. <laughs> I just pulled it up, read the article. <laughs> I didn't make that connection, uh, but I should have. Um, you know, obviously, thanks to both of you for coming on, and 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 thanks for your service. And we'll put the links 
to buy these books. And and there's a new version coming out of Fields of Fire. There's an anniversary, a 40th anniversary um, edition that they've put out already in the Kindle form, and it will be out by say December in the in the paperback. It's no different, other than there's a short essay in the front that I wrote. And, you know, dance the cover up a little bit. So, glad to know it's still in print. It's been a, been a while. So. Yeah, and it's 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 in print, and there's there's lots of um, I'll just say there's lots of books and movies and series and TV shows that I don't know how to say this, but they they, they reflect certainly reflect some of the characters and some of the goings on inside the book. So uh, I'd love to I'd love to see Fields become. Uh, probably a TV series I, I wrote a proposal a year ago on it and we you know it's Hollywood's funny you know it's a uh, when I was working out there a lot I think they were registering 40 close to 40,000 screenplays a year the Writers Guild and they were making 260 movies so you know you get to that final uh, cut off it's uh, pretty competitive but uh, would like to see that well it's, it's been a pleasure being with you and uh, it's been a great conversation yeah thanks for thanks for coming on and I would maybe propose this and I know it's a long trip so maybe next time I'll do the trip but we've done this once before we did it with the novel Musashi which is told people we were gonna do it and then once everyone had the chance to read it we came back I came back on and I had a friend of mine Tim Ferriss who was a a Asian studies major at Princeton and and had lived in Japan and studied judo and we went through the book and kind of you know parsed it apart but uh if you'd ever like to do that let me know and and right thank you come back on and um we'll go through it and and pull you know i i I didn't you know i I like to talk about leadership the leadership lessons inside fields of fire are phenomenal just the pattern recognition of knowing what kind of people you're dealing with and you can learn a lot of that just from the book but i'd love to hear about you know how you got to some of those characters one of my well, one real obvious character is Austin, uh, Sergeant Austin, who's like the by the book Marine that's, hey, it's my way or the highway. And, and just the way, you know, just the way that Hodges kind of handles him. And, and, and there's a certain, there's a conversation that they're having. And you can see Hodges is pushing that, pushing back up against him a little bit. And then he decides, oh, you know, I'm not going to push back any further because I'm going to create a relationship with this guy and we'll get him along the way. But those little subtleties that you put in this book are. Our phenomenal leadership lessons. Yeah, one, one, uh, one small point on that because I probably should have mentioned it earlier. In terms of one of the motivations in writing it is there, there was so much out there demeaning things that happened in Vietnam without a comprehensive understanding not only of Vietnam but of warfare in general. That I felt like it was important to to create characters that could give context to how some of these things happen. You know, um, that's with, with Sergeant Austin, how do, you know, the, 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 the numbers, um, you know, when I was in, in, in law school and writing this about, everybody was getting fragged, mm-hmm. okay? you know? And I remember I had a really good friend who was a, a World War II veteran um, who was needling me one day saying, Tell me about fragging. I said, screw you. I was raised on stories of a bad lieutenant in World War II having 10 seconds once the ramp dropped on the landing craft before somebody was going to get him out of the way. And he said, well, I shot a lieutenant. <laughs> I don't know if he was telling the truth or not, but, you know, it, it, there, uh, there are leadership lessons in, 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 in the book, and there are also – and Austin's one of them. I mean, how do you – how do you create positive environments if you look at where these people had been at the time that he was coming in doing the, you know, the, the pre-Vietnam junk on the bunk, uh, which was probably essential to developing an attitude of discipline when you didn't have this stuff. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, somebody, you got 3.7 million people, over the 500,000 people in Vietnam at the time, a lot of them from pretty rough backgrounds. And, uh, you know, there, there are ways to motivate them, you know, and then there are ways – when things go the other way <laughs> there's ways to get yourself fragged <laughs> well that again didn't, that didn't happen often but it, it was not it, it it did happen you know uh at times yeah so. yeah and it's probably always happened it has and in some form or another yeah, yeah that's why it's important to be a good leadership important to be a good leader especially when the people that you're leading have weapons <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, yeah. well again uh, that's one of the many multitude of of lessons that are in the book and uh, again we'll put them on the website so everyone can get them and you can educate yourself uh, Jim you got any any final thoughts anything else to say no just thanks for having us 
was incredible. Just listening to you two talk back and forth. It's amazing. No, it's been a real pleasure. Well, th- thanks for coming on. Uh, obviously, it's it's an honor to, to, to have you on, and I think anyone that's going to listen to this or anyone that does listen to this, and you're going to hear from a lot of people that do listen to this, um, they keep their their minds open, keep their hearts humble, as you both have talked about today. You guys have set an incredible example for people to follow, and thanks for coming on. It's been an honor to talk to you, and we appreciate most of all your service to the country and yours and yours thank you. Thank you. thanks and at this time our guests have departed the studio awesome to have them on an honor to sit and talk with such men and and it's it's just an honor to be able to do that Agreed. incredible story incredible books and get them the books will be on the website on jockopodcast.com under books books from episodes books from episodes is what the technical name is cool yeah um i think everyone can learn from those books if you read them speaking of learning speaking of teaching and whatnot echo charles maybe you could teach us how to you know get after it a little bit harder sure of course I will. Um, okay, shift gears to jujitsu. Obviously, seems obvious. Seems obvious. Yeah, and I, th- I think you're in the same boat where you default to jujitsu as like a solution or a way to look at things. Even earlier today, we we're talking about true. It is. Something. Yeah, it is. It is a default way to. Well, I've talked about it before. The fact that it's a thread that ties a lot of things together. Yeah. It's comparable to a lot of things. It's a struggle. Life is a struggle. Yeah. Business is a struggle. Combat is a struggle. All these things are a struggle, and you have to learn to deal with them, and they all have threads in them that are the same. So, yes, I do refer to jiu-jitsu from time to time. If you don't like that, go start your own podcast and don't talk about jiu-jitsu. Dang, bro. <laughs> Wait, are you saying me? Shoot. If I don't like that, bro, who do you think you're talking to? Okay. I, I'm just I, making sure. I remember... Actually, I'm remembering it right now. Is that you refer to jujitsu as the solution to something? Humility. That's what it is. Uh, well, that. Definitely. If you want to work on humility, use jujitsu as the answer. That'll help you. Anyway, while you do that, you're gonna need a gi because you're gonna do both gi and no gi. So when you get your gi, no question, go to originmain.com to get your gi. That's where you get it. Hundred percent. Yep. No doubt. No doubt, and uh, you can get rash guards there if you're going to train no gi. You don't have to use a gi in jujitsu. Right. You can. I recommend that you do. I, and if you're wondering if you do, do, should do the gi or no gi, do both. Yeah, that's just that's just the way to go. Yeah. They both will help each other, and they're both useful. And but you can get rash guards if you're going to do jujitsu with a rash guard, which is a good thing to do because it doesn't get all caught up in your opponent's toes. Yes. There's not too many things in life when you're worried about your t- opponent's toes. In jiu-jitsu, you are a little bit worried about your opponent's toes. Yeah, and your own toes, by the way. Yeah, and you can use the rash guards for other activities, such as surfing. Cycling. You don't cycle. I know, but I, I, I hear good things. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, yeah, well, I guess you can wear them for cycling as well. And... And Lifting. spats. Don't forget about spats. Spats, which is essentially compression pants. We'll compression call them, pants. but they're essentially a rash guard for your legs, yeah. for your lo- your other fifty percent of your body. Oh, as Dean Lister would say. Let's check. Uh, plus, they got t shirt. They got clothes. Yeah. And we're making more clothes at Origin. We are making more yeah. clothes at Origin. Yeah, it's like uh, full on underway. By. Yeah, stand de- by denim. Yep. I called Pete the other day. And you didn't get yours yet? No. Your jeans? And that was really the topic oh, of discussion. I'm sure you were right, yeah. critical about that one. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, we're, we're going to make it all close. Keep, just keep paying attention to that, and we'll get them out. Um, supplements. we got some good supplements, things that will help you in all aspects of getting after it. Yeah. For instance, help your joints with joint warfare. Help your joints with krill oil. Help your cognitive and physical capacity with discipline and there's actually so discipline we just made a new form of discipline so there's the discipline powder drink cool here's the problem with the discipline powder drink I'm getting ready to go 
into a meeting and I'm gonna be in there for two hours mm-hmm. and I wanna get like a little bit of a, a cognitive bump. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? A little bit of a sure. <laughs> a little a little yeah. bump. Yes. And I don't maybe wanna drink uh a, a, a thousand or drink five hundred milliliters of water or whatever, a bottle of water. I don't want to sure. drink a bottle of water because I'm then you know, biologically, what's going to occur in 45 minutes if I pounded a bunch of water? Yep. I'm going to have to quit, stop, and use the head. Yeah. Not quit, but I'm going to have to stop for a moment and use <laughs> right. the head, which I don't like. No. So, made uh, one, you know, some pills, uh, a capsule, actually. Capsule. Yeah. A capsule. So, boom, it's got the, it's got a little caffeine in it. It's got some nootropics in it. Gets you a little bit of a. Does it, get, does it have more caffeine than the regular? No. Okay, so it's doing well, literally you, discipline you, you, on the go. Yeah, it's discipline on the go. Yeah. Discipline on the go. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I have mine. Took some. Good. Oh, you got yours? Oh, yeah. Oh, check. I, I don't, I mean, obviously I don't go, not obviously, but I don't go into many JP meetings. JP took some one? Yeah. JP took some and he sent like a text to me and Pete and Brian. He was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I just gave the best speech ever. Yeah, well, okay, so that, I don't feel fired up. When yeah. I well, JP feels fired feels, up anyways. Right, so this so is just like enhancement. You can tell JP going on stage, <laughs> everything's clicking for him. Yes. Oh, you know he's fired up. Yes. Yeah, yeah, hundred yes. percent. Uh, so but, that's okay. discipline. Go, yeah. um, about milk, the milk train. Yeah, milk train, big time. Stay on it <laughs> if you're on it. It's, it's kind of hard to get. The problem with the milk train is you just it ends up just being sort of it's kind of a dessert. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it's interesting because you know the the idea that protein powder is it's either it tastes good or it's good quality. That's it. Oh, that's yeah. sort of it. That's a dichotomy that's that the, used to exist. Used to exist. That, the, 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 the gap in that dichotomy could not be crossed. Yeah. Could not be brought together. It yeah. has been brought together. Been brought together. I was talking to my friend Terry, a.k.a. Big Sexy, last night. <laughs> Is the other milk train? No, that's the thing. Oh. And bro, I might as well have just made a commercial for it. Because you know how you start talking about yeah. it, then you start saying, yeah, and you get yourself kind of fired up yeah. about it. You know, that's what I was doing. Anyway, he was like, hey, man, I got it. It's good. Well, I hopefully got he it. gets on the milk train. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, mint chocolate chip, my personal favorite. Peanut butter chocolate, Dave Burke's personal favorite. Good deal, dude. Vanilla Gorilla, technically... Named not directly for Leif Babin, mm. but certainly associated with Leif Babin. Yeah, <laughs> and he said the other day that he mixed it up, and he was like, Whoa, that, that, that. "He's like, hey, that vanilla gorilla." <laughs> <laughs> he was pumped on the vanilla gorilla. Hey Amen. Good. And, and then there's the darkness, yeah. which is just pure chocolate. Yes, pure and in, chocolate. In my ho- household, the darkness is ascending to oh really mint chip chocolate. Levels, because it has well, like who, a who's, dark chocolate taste. Who's who's? who's, who's this oh, it's guy you right here. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Interesting. I still add peanut butter in it. By the way, I should I should mention that. Uh, that I could understand. Yeah. But um, also, you know, we we also just came out with Warrior Kid Mulk. We got strawberry and chocolate right now. They have a little bit less protein. Mm-hmm. I mean, because if your kid's eight years old, he should hopefully get in pro- protein from natural food sources the problem is sometimes they don't get enough so we got we got some protein in there we got vitamins in there we got some probiotics in there because we know Timmy when he hears about <laughs> he probiotics some. he gets he fired up some, yeah. and this is the amazing thing they are delicious they are just freaking delicious yeah and so in my house the strawberry kids mulk is just getting crazy I as soon as I tasted the strawberry kids mulk I sent Brian a text and said, make adult warrior kid mulk immediately. <laughs> now. So he's got that coming. Oh, right. Adult strawberry. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Adult strawberry. Hmm. And I called it strawberry quick the other day. <laughs> <laughs> That's By where accident. your brain went. Yeah, because yeah, like, yeah. it tastes that good. It's, it's, it literally tastes like strawberry quick. Yeah. The chocolate's damn good, too. But anyways, that's a warrior kid. This is the only drink. This is the only thing that you you got with your kids that you want your kids to have it as bad as they want to have it. There's no other thing in the world that's like that. Yeah. This is it. Maybe I'm, the warrior kid books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. I was so, drinking Mountain Dew the other day. Oh, God. Straight up. What is up with you? Well, yeah, just you just know, a savage. Bear, bear with me. Why are you doing that to yourself? Time. Nonetheless, I was... And I came to kind of this realization. You're fired. 
<laughs> Dude, I'm telling you. Okay, so, okay, so all right, okay. I'm going to be quiet. So bear with me. You know, I'm not pounding Mountain Dews every day. I'm not saying that. But as I it's drink this. Slope. My, it is a slippery slope. As I drink this Mountain Dew, you know how you kind of like reflect yeah. on things. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, what am I drinking? It tastes good. I like my, I've always liked Mountain Dew since literally the first time I tasted it when I was a kid. And so I'm like drinking it. And I'm like, you, you know what I'm drinking right now? It's, poison. It's liquid candy is yeah. what I'm drinking. Literally, like, you know, how, you know, like a um, Jolly Rancher yeah. or one of these, you know, the, that kind of candy. They make lollipops and stuff. Yeah. You know, that kind of candy. Consider this exact flavor, this exact flavor, not more sweet, not less sweet, this exact Mountain Dew flavor as a lollipop mm-hmm. or a Jolly Rancher. It would fit. It would be like, mm. yeah. Was, and I'm just drinking the liquid form of it. Mm. Literally, that's what I'm drinking. Did you finish the can? Well, it was one of those small cans. So. Did you finish it? Yeah. I was eating sushi. You know how it is. Like it's the whole deal. Check. Long story. Nonetheless, that's what it is. But there's so, no reason for this anymore because now we have milk. Yeah, and you can kind of consider the difference, right? Where the, you know, your kid, if they're like how I was, and you see the Mountain Dew as a kid, you're like, oh, I want that Mountain Dew. But the parents are like, no, do you? We don't drink why Mountain don't you Dew. Drink, why, don't, why don't you drink Jocko White tea instead? Bring a can with you. Well, it's you know, I have a bunch of cans. It, it's a long story. You know, and we're working very hard on the whole situation, but nonetheless, it happened, and you know we're gonna move on. But if you're a kid, you want the Mountain Dew. I notice now it's Mountain Dew. It this is. is right up there with cotton it's and important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you say it. The tea. It's not a sign of tea. Nonetheless, if this, so you compare the scenarios. Kid wants the Mountain Dew. It's like, yeah, of course you want the Mountain Dew. It tastes good. But the parents are like, no, we don't drink Mountain Dew. That, yeah, yeah. that's crap that's liquid candy we don't, you know that we're not doing that it's not healthy for us but the kid wants the milk boom parent yes every all time every yeah. time parents 100%. are like hey do you want some more milk yeah yes I do actually check cool good so that's that's originmain.com for all that stuff yeah a lot of good stuff on there also we have a store Indeed. Jocko has a store called Jocko store hmm. anyway there you can get also get rash guards some cool shirts if you want to represent discipline equals freedom. A few designs on that one. Yeah, there's some new designs on there, on that store in general. Mm-hmm. So yeah, man, check them out. If you want to get something, get something. Trucker's hats. Trucker's my hat. wife said something about Jocko's store, and then my youngest daughter said, you have a store? And I said, yeah. And she says, where is it? <laughs> on the internet, man. It's virtual. Yep. It's virtual Jocko's store. Yep. It's called Jocko's store. Tell them. Let your friend know. But yeah, some good stuff. Some hoodies on there as well. Hats, as Jocko said, trucker and flex fit. But yeah, go on there. And, you know, if you want something, if you like something, get something. Good way to stay on the path and represent at the same time. Mm -hmm. Boom. Do you rep when you're, does it help you stay on the path? I think so, yes. There's There's quite a few people that feel... When they put on the uniform, right? The uniform, they get it's true. in the game. You know, it's a classic, archetypical part of the hero's journey is they're getting their gear on. Yeah, suiting up. You know, they're suiting up. Oh, yeah. That's part of the deal. You watch a movie. What do they show? The, whether it's a soldier getting his boots on, lock and loaded his weapon. You know in the movies when they open up like the war chest? Oh, yeah, big like, time. Like in, like in Mike and the Dragons it opens sure. up the war chest, right? Yeah. In... Commando. Uh, commando. Remember, gearing up. He gets onto the shore. The final battle scene, right? He gets on the shore. Oh, yeah. It was like a whole montage. Boots, uh, bulletproof vest. Uh, you know, I don't know if it was bulletproof. I don't know. Doesn't matter. He's zipping it up. Yeah, you see he, what I'm saying? He, he, I think that vest was more up. just, you know. Just dope. Just. <laughs> <laughs> put grenades it was on it. Just but, Hollywood, 100%. You know, they paint the face with the thing. Well, you know that charcoal yeah, that they yeah, paint yeah. their face with? Yeah, oh, it's man. called cami paint, yeah. <laughs> yeah, bro. So I'm telling you, it's suiting up. It's big so part yeah, of the because game. of that, um, yeah, you can you can get suited up, and then you feel like you're getting in the zone for whatever it is you're about to go do. Because you yeah. got that shirt that says, get after it, yeah. or whatever. Well, big time. Yeah, when you get a new rash guard, you're that much more compelled to go train. Mm-hmm. If you so this is a thing that starts when you're like six years old and you get a new pair of shoes and it just lasts your whole life. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, cause, yeah, actually the shoes that's a good example because remember when you're a kid? I don't know, you might be different, but I think most of us when we're a kid, you know, when you got the new shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, like, you want to go to school faster. I want. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> See, you're thinking functionality, which I dig, by the way. But you get the new shoes, the new Chuck Taylors. Mm-hmm. 
the half red, half green ones. You ever read those ones? No. Anyway, we had those. And so you buy them or you get them, whatever, mm-hmm. from your parents. And you're like, can't wait to just wear these to, sh- to school. Oh. And, like, everyone's going to see them and all this stuff. So compared to if you don't have new shoes, do you really want to go to school? Sure, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. But with the Chuck Taylor, the new shoes, yeah. you will want to go. That's how. Same thing with the gym. The same thing with anywhere. If you got some new clothing to represent with, big time. Check. Do you wear dry dry fit? Is I think it's what it's called. You wear dry fit, right? Well, in what? Like a shirt way. It's called dry fit for like working out. And yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like we don't have any of that. We need to. I know that's what I, was, I just thought of that right now. You just thought of that. Here's the thing. I knew that before because you. I think you and some no, people early actually, on said that. I'm working on. It. We're we're working on it. We're working on it at Origin that we can make. Okay, cool. Dry fit, yeah. not uh, compression. Like loose fit, right? Yeah. Loose fit. Loose yeah. fit, quick dry. That's what we're making. Yeah. A guy gave me a pretty about. dope red one at the muster. Mm-hmm. And I was like, D- I don't wear dry fit at all. Mm-hmm. I put it on. I was like, dang, I, I, I like it. Mm-hmm. It's good. Mm-hmm. So boom, it's kind of on my radar now. Yeah, well, I think you measure most shirts by their sleeve size. <laughs> <laughs> so I think must have had some small sleeves and you were stoked. That's classified. Anyway, Check. also, stay on the path. Keep, stay on the path. Keep yourself on the path by subscribing to this podcast. I know it seems obvious, but sometimes when people are new, they're like, oh, yeah, cool podcast. In fact, or you're in that trial period because there, there are certain podcasts that I'll be like, hey, I hear good things. I'm going to go listen to it. And I only listen to it like at the gym or something like this mm-hmm. or on, under certain circumstances. And I'll forget, you know, like I won't listen to it at other times. So I'll come back to the gym or something like that. I go, oh, let me find that podcast. Mm-hmm. And you got to kind of do the search or whatever. You just subscribe. So I can see that scenario being the case. You see what I'm saying? For yeah. people, because you know how well we say, of course, they're going to subscribe. Seems obvious. It's obvious. You don't have to tell people to subscribe. They're either going to subscribe if they like it or not. But sometimes you do forget there are circumstances, what I'm saying. So... Here's a reminder, subscribe. While you're subscribing to this podcast, also subscribe to the Warrior Kid podcast. We have some more Warrior Kid podcast episodes coming. I apologize that they're taking long. It is my fault for not being more squared away, prioritizing better, and working harder. But I have some almost ready for the release. Cool. Uh, Also, while you're looking at Warrior Kid stuff, you can check out irishoaksranch.com and get some, some Warrior Kid soap from American-made soap, from a 13-year-old kid that is raising goats, getting the milk from the goats and turning it into soap. Yeah, good soap too, by the way. On a farm here in California. A lot of people don't know that California is massive agriculture and farming. So you can support that with a little warrior kid soap. Also, don't forget about the YouTube. While you're subscribing, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel Jocko podcast where you can watch these podcasts on there if you want to see us if you want to see Jim Webb and James Webb you want to see what their reactions are and see what they look like you can subscribe or you can go to the YouTube and check it out you can also see echoes enhanced videos which he is quite proud of <laughs> I'm proud that you said use the word legit I'm well they are legit that. I will give you uh, credit when credit is due and they they enhance the message functionally sure like being able to read the words that's functional usage so it's not just is not just effects for the sake of effects which I probably wouldn't call legit you know you do do throw some of that stuff in there sometimes when when walls are exploding (laughs) yeah it might be a little bit beyond but sometimes he goes a little too far let him know let him know if his videos are a little bit much yep he learns, it's like the guy that learns something and they learn the cowbell. They get a new cowbell for the drum set and they put it in through the whole album. It's just cowbell. What's a cowbell? It's like a, it's a cowbell. I mean, and, but people use it in music occasionally. It should be used sparingly. So it's a re- actual cowbell. Yeah, it's a cowbell. Okay. Ding. Okay. Or like more like a bong. Okay. I can't really do the noise. Sure. But, but they're, yeah. they're, cause in, especially drums, actually all instruments really, they have like names. For you know, like hi hat. <laughs> yeah, There's that's the name of the hat. drum. I know, but see what I'm saying though. That's like a name for a drum. <laughs> like if you've never seen a drum or never heard of a drum, someone says hi hat, they'd be like, I know what hi means and I know what hat means. Okay, but yeah. hi hat is a name for a, you see what yeah. I'm saying? I thought that was the same deal for cowbell. No, no, no. It's a, it's, it's actually now they cowbell. make 
I mean, I don't know what the cowbells look like in 1850, yeah. but this has definitely been cleaned up and modified so it's a cowbell looking thing, drum. but it's for your, you don't, you don't go to the farm store to buy a cowbell for your drum set. Gotcha. No, okay. you go to the, the music store and you say, I need a cowbell. I understand. And, when then, you say and then you start using it in every song. And you think everyone wants to just hear that cowbell. Yeah, yeah, because you like it. <laughs> and there's a whole skit on Saturday Night Live about the cowbell. Okay, I was just going to ask one that. of the patches that guys had in TU Bruiser that eventually got banned, one of the patches was more cowbell based on the Saturday Night Live skit. Gotcha, okay. And I always did actually wonder about that more cowbell. <laughs> Where'd that go? Now you know. You never know what you're gonna learn. Also, Unless. Psychological Warfare, that's an album with tracks where you can stay on the path and we're making another one and it's coming out soon. And that's it on that. Good. Also, if you want to vary up your workout, get more workout gear. Go to onit.com slash Jocko. Also, they got some good immunity stuff that I actually took. It reminded me because I, I just took some, felt the cold coming on. Shroom mm. Tech Immune. It's a good one. You like that one. I very much like that one. Never let me know. Before you travel, take that. Nonetheless, there's a lot of cool stuff on there. And information. That's another one that like you can get caught up in a bad way, but it's a good resource when you want to vary up your workouts and mm-hmm. do some new workouts. Kettlebells, even that, that club workout, mm-hmm. which I would highly recommend mm-hmm. looking into what to do. Yeah, Don't just pick that thing up that. and start getting nuts. No. Might get you, might jam you up. You also got Jocko White Tea. Which tastes delicious and it's good for you. Mm-hmm. I say again, tastes delicious and good for you. That seems to be the theme. Yeah. If we're going to put something in our body, we want it to taste good, yes, and we want it to be good for us. Jocko White Tea. And there's no doubt that it's good for you because there's, it's the only product, the only product that I've ever heard of, where an 8,000 pound deadlift is guaranteed 100%. Yeah. Never failed. Me too. So get you some of that. Get your deadlift up. Also, we got some books. Uh, first of all, the books we read today, and and James Webb's James Webb has ten books that he's written. Uh, the two that we covered today w- will both be on the website Fields of Fire, and then I heard my country calling. These are the two books I read today. He also mentioned a book called The Nightingale Song, which is a great book, and we'll put that one on as well. Did you hear me? Yeah. Nightingale Song. Nightingale. Song, song okay. yep. Great book. It's about the the class, the, the Naval Academy guys that graduated with Jim Webb and what they did. They all had a huge impact on the Navy and on the country. And it's, well, the, this particular group that he talks about. So we'll put that book on there as well because it's a great book and perhaps I'll cover it at some point. Obviously for books, we also have Way of the Warrior Kid and Mark's Mission. If you know kids, get them these books and it'll get them on the right path of of going in the right direction of doing the right things it's just going to be it's it's going to help kids out the the feedback that i've gotten from around the world and yes i've gotten feedback from around the world by around the world i mean australia new zealand i've gotten a whole package of letters from a classroom in new zealand of kids that are on the path so if you read a book imagine you you read a book and you're 7 years old 9 years old and you decided that the book was good enough that you were gonna try and find the author who lives on the other side of the world and write him a note and say thanks because I'm on the path now. Mm. That's the book right there. Way the Warrior Kid and Mark's Mission. Also, Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. This, you know what this is? Christmas time. Mm -hmm. It's a Christmas, this book is a gift. It's a gift for people that you know that you wanna help. Mm -hmm. If you have an enemy, don't give it to them. Because then your enemy's gonna get on the path, probably come back and whatever defeat you 18 months yeah. and they'll be jacked and they'll be focused and they'll crush you or so, or yes you're right or they could if they well I guess if they're it depends on their level of of malevolence in their soul because yeah. if they have a little bit of good in there you know what they're gonna do they're gonna read that little part about laughter wins and they're gonna see that the light is gonna overcome the darkness and maybe they'll come back to you in 18 months and like hey I got you something Yep. Boom. And we're not we, now enemies we, anymore. Now we're not enemies anymore. Yep. We're moving in the right direction. By the way, do you want to train? By the way, do you want to jack some steel? Yep. By the way, do you want to go out and eat some steak? Because I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> so that might actually be the move right Yeah, there. that could be the move. Nicely done. I like the way you think. That audio book is not on Audible. It is on iTunes, Amazon Music, Google Play, other MP3 platforms. Extreme Ownership, 
first book I wrote with my brother Leif Babin. That's um, taking the principles that we used in combat and then applying them to business and life. And then we followed that up with another book called The Dichotomy of Leadership. Another New York Times bestseller, which is super cool and all that, but whatever. Let's face it, what we wanted to do was write a book that actually expanded and made people better leaders. Feedback we're getting on that one is that's what it's helping people do. The little, the little nuances of extreme ownership that are, that are harder to handle and harder to master, this book will help you do it. The, the dichotomy of leadership, available everywhere. Appreciate everyone getting that. Of course, now we have Mikey and the Dragons. It is coming out um, November 15th. I'm trying to get as many printed as I can right now because you all ordered a lot of them. <laughs> so thank you. And it's about a little kid who's scared of everything and he finds a book. And in the book, the king is dead in this village, or in this kingdom. And there's a prince that's gonna have to stand up and fight. So that's what he, that's what he does. The prince has to stand up and fight, but he's scared because he's only seven. So. That's that. A little little excerpt from it. Do a little excerpt. Excerpt. I do a little excerpt. The king had always been so strong and brave, and protected the kingdom from the dragon cave. The dragon cave was just over the hill and filled with scary creatures that were ready to kill. Horrible dragons of every single type, who thought people in the kingdom were especially ripe. The people thought the dragons had breath of fire and that the dragon stood 20 feet tall or higher. They thought the dragons had sword stopping scales and powerful long razor sharp tails. But the brave king never let the beast around. He stood up and fought and held his ground. And as long as the king had been the king, none of the dragons could do a thing. Yes, the king always kept the dragons at bay by going out bravely into the fray. It seemed without fear the king would go fight. He'd beat the dragons and come home at night. But now that the king had died and was gone, there was only one person to fight and carry on. But that person wasn't big or mighty or strong. In fact, he hadn't been alive that long. Now the person who had dragons to chase was just a little boy with a smiling face. Yes, the person that now must stand up and be bold was just the little prince who was only seven years old. So, so there you go. Of course, the villagers are worried if this little kid's going to be able to do it. And, well, get the book. You'll find out what happens when he goes up to face the dragons. And, and by the way, you guys put this book to number 17 on Amazon of all books pre-release. That's crazy. So you guys called me out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I'm printing as fast as I can. And the the good news is I'm printing more of these first editions. So the first editions is going to continue. I'm going to print as many as I can and get it out and get it to you, everyone, hopefully by Christmas. Appreciate it for the support against against the big boys. Yeah, speaking of big boys, Mm. you remember how you used to talk trash about the publishing company, try to be all conservative. (laughs) And look at you now. Yeah, Yeah, I, I uh, I was conservative. Yeah. And I was too conservative. Yeah. I didn't realize how much people were going to get after it. Whoa. And I got texts from my buddies that are saying, I just ordered 10 copies. I just ordered 14 copies. I yeah. just ordered 19 copies for every kid in my extended family. Yeah, man. And, and I'm I, like, I that's awesome. Yeah. I will get them printed as fast as I can. Yeah, I pulled out all stops and I'm making remember, it happen. Hey, you know what? It's my fault. I should I should have ordered more. Yeah, I should order more because those exact things that you said about yourself were the exact same things you were saying about the publishing company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't know how pe- people were going to get after it. Well, you just said that about the publishing company. They yep. don't understand. Yep. Maybe I apparently I didn't understand. We all don't. Understand. I should have taken my own advice. Now we do. Now we know. There you go. The books are being printed as fast as I can print them. Let's see, that's what I like about you. So, bro. apologize for that. It's my fault. I should have taken my own advice, and. Well, now I'm getting after it. Yes, yes, you are, sure. We'll get them out there, printing a ton more. Also, Echelon Front Leadership Consultancy. We solve problems through leadership. That's what we do at the Echelon Front team. Me, Leif Babin, J.P. Donnell, Dave Burke, Flynn Cochran, Mike Sorelli, and Mike Baima. So if you need help in your organization, call us. 
call us now because we are booked up so if you are thinking about doing this in the future call now echelonfront.com go get on there and we'll hook up also muster 2019 we got chicago and denver dates aren't completely locked yet but check extremeownership.com for the information and to and to find out when it is live and when you can book and make your reservations all the musters have sold out and this one these will too so get on it early ef overwatch as well we're connecting spec ops and combat aviators to companies that need leaders so the military produces trains and tests in combat environment leadership and we're taking those leaders those experienced leaders and bringing them into the civilian sector efoverwatch.com if you want to get on in the game on either side so whether you're a spec ops or you're combat aviation and you're looking for what your next mission is going to be or your company that's looking for experienced trained leaders to come and help you out folks that understand the mentality of extreme ownership and what we do at echelon front go to efoverwatch.com and if you want to keep discussing these things with us we are available on the interwebs on twitter on instagram and on that fishy book echo is at echo charles and i am at jocko willink and thanks once again to james and jim webb for their service and for joining us on the podcast to share their lessons learned it was an honor to be able to sit and talk with them and thanks to everyone else that has served or is serving in the military around the world out there holding the line and also thanks to police and law enforcement firefighters paramedics emts correctional officers border patrol all the first responders everyone that is out there doing what you do for us on the home front thank you for what you do every day and to everyone else that is listening thanks for listening thanks for supporting thanks for spreading the word it is much appreciated and in the book fields of fire one of the main characters Hodges in part of the book he quotes an old hymn an old hymn that he's thinking about in his head and that old hymn says time like an ever rolling stream bears all its sons away they fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day so there you go a little reminder a little reminder to all of us that time is fleeting time is short and we only get so much so don't wait around don't put it off instead get up and yes get after it and until next time this is echo and jocko out <laughs>